those of you who may not come before this committee all the time or ever, we'll introduce ourselves and then we'll get started. I'm Jeanette White from Wyndham County. I'm Anthony Polito from Washington County. Brian Collin, Moore, Rutland County. Allison Clarkson, Windsor County District. <laughs> and we will be joined by Chris Bray from Addison. Um, so we have two bills. Tucker, would you like to join us? That we're going to vote out today before we start this because it's going to take us about three minutes on each. Um, we work fast. So Tucker, would you like to do 143 um, and tell us the change you made? Yes, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Tucker Anderson, Legislative Council, Office of Legislative Council. Uh, after yesterday's discussion of H 143, I drafted an amendment that will change the effective date from July 1st, 2019 to July 1st, 2020. Good, because we try not to do retroactive legislation. This, this one would be particularly troublesome. It would be so. particularly troublesome. This is um, allowing towns to do away with their town agent. So, all right, so are we ready for a vote or is there sure. any more comments? Good for it. I vote we move out H, draft 1.1 H 143. As amended. As amended. Yes. Great. So you want to vote on the amendment or just? No, we're just going to vote on the whole. Great. It's just the draft. I would second it. Okay. All right. Um, you want to call the roll? Absolutely. Uh, Bray. <coughs> Clarkson, yes. Colin. Yes. Polina. Yes. White. Yes. Great. And may we leave it open for Senator Bray to weigh in? Yes, we Thank can. You. Do you? Right. And who's do reporting? You to oh, Anthony wants to report it. Oh, oh you're willing gonna, to report right, it? Sure. Okay. I was going to offer. But. Okay. Well, we have another one right now. You can report that. <laughs> Your generosity should be extended. Okay. One eighty-six. One thing I would like to mention okay. to Tucker. We could do this later, but yes. there's elements of this bill that relate to specific towns. I just want to remember which, which what they are. Not right now, but we'll have I think that'd be helpful. Okay. <coughs> okay. So S one eighty six was really a technical correction that um, because it referred back to um, we repealed something in two thousand six. We repealed section two fifty one of something, but didn't. Uh, repeal 252, which referred back to 251. And so this is a technical correction only that also repeals that section. Um, and we have cleared it with the, um, it has to do with bonded officials, who needs to be bonded in the state and how that's determined. And we've cleared this with the administration to make sure they're okay with it and the treasurer. Everybody's okay. Nobody had any concerns about it. It does what it's supposed to do. So. Anybody want to um, make a motion on this one? I move, go ahead. I move we vote out S-186. Second. Okay. Any more comments? Anybody out there want to weigh in on this? Guess not. Okay. Uh, Bray. Clarkson. Yes. Colm. Yes. Polina. Yes. White. Yes. Great. Motion passes, and we're going to keep it open for right yeah. away. And do you want to yes. report this one? Okay. I'd like to express my appreciation of the chair's indulgence in my sometimes limited absence in the afternoon for officiating, so I'd be glad to report this. You, you left two minutes before everybody else did. Well. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thank you. Okay, now we're going to move on to the issue of public records. And Tucker is once again our drafter around public records, our, our uh, guidance, our counsel. And I'm just going to uh, lay the uh, stage here a little bit. We do not have a bill. Tucker and I worked together over the summer to possibly do a bill, and the bill was, would have been meant to be a placeholder so that we had something to work from. But as we thought about it, it seemed that um, if, if I turned in that bill and it got published, 
which is what happens, that that's where the energy would go, was on that bill, even though it was only meant to be a placeholder. But everybody would glom in on, that's a technical term, glom, and glom in on the, the changes that were in that bill. So we decided not to have a bill itself, but to just begin to take testimony and then create a committee bill if we felt there needed to be any changes or um, wherever we went, we would do it through a committee process. We have a deadline of January 31st to have committee bills done and we will try really hard to make sure we have anything done by then. However, I do understand that there's a public, some kind of a public records bill in the house. I don't even know what it is, but if it passes, we can use it as a vehicle if we can't get done. But our goal is to try to finish this up by the 31st of January, which is not very, uh, lo a very long time. But you can see from the passage of the last two bills, we work fast, so here we go. Okay, so Tucker, is going to, um, thank you for laughing. <laughs> Tucker is going to um, kind of walk us through very quickly what the current statutes are, what, it, what they say, and um, a little summary of the court case this summer that kind of brought us here right now. Is that fair? That is fair. Good afternoon. Again, for the record, Tucker Anderson, Legislative Council. Uh, happy to be speaking first today in my brief but illustrious baseball career. I was a leadoff batter. Um, to provide two very general outlines or frameworks that you can start with today. Uh, first, big picture note. The Public Records Act is the general procedure for accessing government records, but it is not the exclusive. There are more specific procedures that are set out throughout the VSA for particular records that the government manages. What we'll be talking about today is the default or general right of access that is enshrined in 1 VSA, Chapter 5, Subchapter 3, and it outlines again how the public, under general terms, is capable of accessing records that are produced or acquired in the course of a public agency's business. That sounded like a lot. To give you an example of the distinction, vital records, which I know you have spent a lot of time on over the last few years. It's a very specific procedure for accessing them and for acquiring a copy, certified copy of certain certificates. You have to pay certain fees for them. Only certain individuals are entitled to receive those records. That's a specific records access statute. Here we have the general. To frame how to look at the Public Records Act, I'll give you three terms to think about as you move through the legislative session. The first is duty, the duties of a public agency, whether that be to produce a particular record or, as we'll touch upon later in exemptions, the duty to withhold certain information concerning an individual, concerning sensitive or confidential information. The second is management. That is a structure of management around government records. Some of them are very particular in statute. Some of them are more um, discretionary on the part of an agency. But overall, management plays a key and vital role in how records are kept and ultimately how they are accessed by the public. The final is access. And that's what we're going to talk about today, just that one pillar. Uh, and that is the Public Records Act allowing access to records. Uh, to begin from the top, as my colleague Betsy Ann Rask always says, we'll start with uh, briefly touching upon an article within the Vermont Constitution, and that's in Chapter 1, Article 6. Um, in that article, you have this principle that uh, government officers are trustees of the public, and that uh, I'll just read it so that I don't summarize and misquote. That all power being originally inherent in and consequently derived from the people, therefore all officers of government, whether legislative or executive, are their trustees and servants and at all times in a legal way accountable to them. 
This has been reviewed a few times by the Supreme Court. And each time that they've looked at it, they have said that this is a vision that is articulated in the Constitution, that it is not self-executing, and that ultimately the contours of this principle are outlined and designed by the legislature. So all of that boiled down is to say that you have the power to determine what the contours of this right of access are. Um, I was asked to be brief, which is not always one of my skills, so I will breeze through a few uh, parts of the Public Records Act that do not relate to charges associated with complying with a Public Records Act request, and save that for the end, where we'll do a little more detail. To move through, uh, a key point in the Public Records Act is a statement of policy. It incorporates that chapter one, article six language, and frames it as a balancing act for the reviewing public agency. When a request comes in, the agency has to balance the public's interest in disclosure against the individual's uh, expectation uh, or interest in privacy. Um, that, again, is important in that first pillar that I discussed earlier, the duty of the agency. Often an agency is given the express duty to withhold information, right? There's no discretion there. Sometimes the Public Records Act is not so well attuned to describing the differences between discretionary exemptions and mandatory exemptions. Something to keep in mind. In section 317, uh, you have the definitions and exemptions. Just to reacquaint you with your old friend, the Public Records Act, public agencies include all committees, branches, agencies within uh, state government and local government. A public record includes any recorded information, written, recorded, texts, emails, body cam footage, doesn't really matter how it's recorded, it's just that it is recorded. Uh, within Section 317, you have the 42 enumerated exemptions. However, uh, there are numerous exemptions throughout the Vermont Statutes Annotated. Uh, they mostly deal with uh, the balance, again, between that privacy interest and the public's interest in disclosure of a certain record. In uh, Section 318, the Act provides the procedure for a public agency responding to a Public Records Act request. In general, just to refresh your memory, the range, the time range that a public agency has to respond to a records request is either three, seven, or 10 business days. And those first two say three calendar days, seven calendar days, 10 business days. Important distinctions there. There are different triggering events for how those timelines come up. If for some reason you want to revisit them, I can provide more detail, but I will continue being brief. Uh, I'll move on to section 316, access to public records. Uh, this is the section that deals specifically with costs, and it was the focus and subject of the Doyle case that we'll touch upon right before I leap out of this chair and jump back behind me. Uh, touch upon the language in subsection B of that section. It deals with the use of copying equipment that is maintained by the public agency and how a public agency may charge for the use of that copying equipment. Subsection C is where there's a little more play. And this deals with charging and collecting for the staff time associated with complying with a request for a copy of a public record. And I did intentionally emphasize that in my dulcet monotone uh, because that will be a subject in the Doyle case, the use of the term copy throughout this section. The basis for uh, charging for staff time, um, again, Triggering events. First, the time directly involved in complying with the request exceeds 30 minutes. Once you go beyond 30 minutes, that's when you start triggering that staff time charge. 
The agency agrees to create a public record. So I'll give you an example. Someone writes in and requests a record that does not exist in that form, but you might have uh, a mosaic of information that could be used to create that. The public agency says, we don't have a record. That record doesn't exist. However, we'd be willing to create it so long as you agree to pay for the staff time involved in creating it for you. Third, the agency agrees to provide the public record in a non-standard format, and the time directly involved in complying with the request exceeds 30 minutes. So, easy example here. The standard format that you are keeping the record in is electronic, and the individual wants physical bound copies with a leather cover and gold leaf pages, then you are free to establish charges for that. Uh, an interesting note here in subsection G, this subsection states that a public agency shall use its own equipment to copy records, and that this section, section 316, shall not be construed to require any public agency without copying equipment to allow the use of other equipment. But what is the silent piece that is missing here that could use some clarity? If you maintain your own equipment, do you have to allow the use of other equipment? Subsection J provides that public agencies may adopt reasonable rules to prevent disruption of operations, preserve the security of public records or documents, and to protect them from damage. Now, I will touch upon two quotes from Doyle. I will read them for you. I think that they are clear in how the court looked Oops, at section 316. No. I think that might have been bell. us. It's oh, one of that? our warning bells. Oh, it wasn't somebody's phone? No, damn. I was ready for Sarducci. Yeah. <laughs> if your phone goes off in this committee, you have to treat us all and our chosen guests to dinner at Sarducci's. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, so look, everybody runs out to turn off their phones. Sorry. <laughs> and, and Tucker and well, Gail. I was going to say, but I'm always the chosen guest. So. No, no, you're there, and you can choose your guest. Great. Yeah. OK. Uh, so the, yeah. in the Doyle case, they interpreted the plain language of the statute. They looked in particular at disjunctive ors and the use of the word copy versus inspect. Um, the court, and I will quote, said, Section 316C authorizes an agency to charge and collect the cost of staff time associated with complying with a request for a copy of a public record. It is underlined there by the court because they really wanted to emphasize that. Mm -hmm. By its plain language, this provision authorizes charges only for requests for copies of public records, not for requests for inspection. We will not read an implied condition into a statute unless it is necessary in order to make the statute effective. If we interpret 316C as applying to requests to inspect, it would render a copy of mere surplusage. The court despises absurdity in that manner. Uh, next, the plain language throughout 316 indicates the legislature's intent to distinguish requests to inspect public records from requests to copy them. Section 316 begins by providing that any person <coughs> may inspect or copy, and that's the disjunctive or that they are looking at. This disjunctive or creates a distinction between requests to inspect and to copy that continues throughout the section. The statute specifies the times when a person may inspect public records, authorizes charges associated with records for copies, and further addresses charges, equipment, monies, and formats for copies. The holding was that state agencies may not charge for staff time spent responding to requests to inspect public records pursuant to the Public Records Act. To frame uh, how this may have shifted things for public agencies and their conduct in responding to public records requests. Whether or not charges may apply to a given records request will now depend on how the request is submitted and whether the agency is providing a copy. So where does that leave our agencies? I am sure you will hear plenty of testimony today about the state of the state and the Public Records Act. Any questions? 
I have to say I was a little confused by the. Um, I do not did not remember that it was very specifically stated that you could only charge for requests for a copy. I mean, I am, know you charge for the copy itself, but I I had. Guess I missed that somehow. <laughs> um, I will note for you, I provided, um, I submitted to Gail a copy of the 2012 interim report from the Public Records Study Committee. And the act that created that committee charged the committee to look at specifically whether uh, there should be charges to inspect public records and the time associated with preparing those records. And during the first year that the study committee met, they did not answer that question. They delayed it for future years. And part of that was they were waiting for data on uh, the increase in public records requests at the municipal level. And they said, you know, we will revisit this later. But unfortunately, that was one of the things that got left behind in a very prolonged discussion about exemptions. Um, if you read the description under that charge of what the committee was looking at, um, and if you look at the act, the act says very specifically that they wanted to determine whether requesters were uh, circumventing charges for staff time by making requests to inspect. The issue has resurfaced, um, and if the committee would like, we can always provide the materials that the uh, Public Records Study Committee looked at in 2012 as they were heading towards that particular issue. I think this is the same thing you were just talking about, but Section 316 makes it clear. I mean, it seems clear to me that there's a charge to collect the cost of staff time associated with complying with the request for a copy. That's different than a request to go get the stuff. There's getting the gathering the stuff, and then there's copying the stuff, right? Um, <clears throat> that too technical? By the plain language, right. that, that is how it is written. That's how it was read by the court. And um, I'll note that this was broached by a few states in the mid-2000s and by the U.S. government. The Open Government Act of 2007 addressed uh, how charges first would be applied, looking at uh, this process as three separate stages. First, review of a request. Second, the search. And third, the duplication of a record under a Freedom of Information Act request, right? So you have those kind of three parts. And charges can be applied under any of those three parts, depending on who the requester is. They broke requesters into three categories. There were effectively, you know, uh, private firms that have to pay for all three. My review of your request, my search for the records, and my duplication of those records. The media, which only has to pay for two of those, but I can't remember which one. Uh, and then all other individuals that pay for review and duplication. Thank you. But they don't pay for the gathering. I just want to yes, be clear on that. Yes, there's... There's divisions. I can't recall which the media has to pay for. I believe the media requests under <coughs> the Freedom of Information Act don't have to pay for the review. They pay for the search and the duplication. Okay. So where, where would something like um, redacting information, would that be part of the review or the search? The review is strictly when the request comes in. Reviewing the request itself. Reviewing the request itself to determine where the records will be held. If I have to, you know, clarify the request with the individual. So the search would process. involve any. Um, so it would, con it think would of be it as actual, kind of search and preparation of the. Correct. If you had to redact information, okay. Mm -hmm. And from and from what we understand, the search is the huge time consumer, and that would include redacting. Yeah, and the search, I mean, just searching itself may not be the time consumer, the redacting and the yep. getting it in. Just, I, I, I don't know. It probably depends on the different agencies. So The uh, Public Records Act request. relationship with FOIA has been interesting in yeah. the past, but if you would like more information on how 
FOIA works, I would be happy to put that together for you. Thank you. And Tucker, it might be easier if you sat at the table than tried to juggle all your things in a chair. It's so okay, give it a slide. Green book. Mm -hmm. With its insert update. Yeah. So join us on either end. All right, so um, we have a relatively long list of people who want to testify, and I'm sure there will be even more people who want to testify at a later date, but we'll just start going through them here, and we will keep doing this. Um, I think we already have it on the schedule for next week on I think it's Thursday. Thursday. I think next week is when. So, um, Senator Brock, is Senator Brock? Are we going to call for him? Let him know when he we're needs, ready. He asked if, if if one of us would run and get him and find him. Well, oh, okay. oh, can you just email Faith? Okay. Sorry, he thought he was at the end. No, well, he asked to be at the beginning. Okay. Maybe he asked Gail to put him at the beginning. Yeah, and maybe that he asked me to. Okay. Um, well, I hate to have him come in in the middle of somebody's testimony. Why don't I just so. Okay. Okay. Give him that email. Oh. Maybe in the interim I could ask him to talk about the question. Yes, you may. So how about the situation where I made a request for a written public record? I take my cell phone out and make a copy of it. Where does that fall in this situation? That is an open question that I am certainly based on what I heard in uh, House Government Operations. You will hear testimony about it. Because is that an inspection or is that a review? Or well, is that a document? Well, I'm more concerned with whether it's a copy. But if right. I, I mean, it definitely is a copy, but it's my phone. And, and it's it was, you know, their equipment, so I'm. I'm well, I think, I think um, he pointed out some here, guidance or non guidance here, that the agency shall use its own equipment to right. copy, but it okay. shall not be construed to require the public agency without to allow the use of other equipment. But it doesn't say you can't allow the use of other equipment. leading clause to yeah. those lines saying that the Section 316 shall not be interpreted to require the agency to allow copying yeah. on, you know, individuals' own machinery. It says that if the agency does not man maintain its own machinery, the open question in that particular subsection is, if you have your own copying machinery, do you also have to allow an individual to use their own? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, Senator Brock, I, I know you have a little bill here. I do. About that, uh, uh, copies uh, for the committee. Thank you. That deals with public right. records. We just keep and, one if um, I can. In a very, and I, and in what um, we, Senator Brock and I talked, and it seemed to make sense to um, deal with this in the same um, time and the same in the same issue as other public records issues. Could, and I know that there will be some other public records issues that relate very specifically to certain types of records that will come up. So we thought we would just throw it all in the, in the bunch. So would you like to? Sure. This is a, a, a fairly simple. Remember to identify yourself with the record. Uh, yes, Senator Randy Brock. Uh, this is a small bill that's designed as a transparency measure. Uh, I should, by way of disclosure, I tripped upon this uh, issue during a consulting project for my private interests uh, two or three years ago, but I have no interest whatsoever, nor am I doing any work in this area at all, nor have I for the past year and a half. Uh, but what I saw was looking at one particular entity that was a entity that was a nonprofit a corporation formed by the state. Uh, and looking for public records about what that entity was doing, uh, the entity indicated that it didn't have to provide any records because it was a private corporation. That entity, though, was created by the state, largely funded by the state, 
performing a state function uh, organizationally. It had two agency secretaries who by law were members of the uh, corporation's board of directors and it also had one gubernatorial appointee uh, as part of the board of directors. The board itself was self-perpetuating though that the majority of other members of the board uh, elected their other members, but nonetheless, these government officials were still part of the organization. What I found was that they ultimately did provide the requested information, but with the proviso that they were advised by counsel that they didn't have to. This entity also had formed a for-profit subsidiary of which the entity owned 100% of the capital stock and then of the Class A stock and of the Class B stock, they in turn had some venture capitalists own some portion of that. And that venture capital firm, or that, that entity, uh, loaned money to Vermont companies that the state had an interest in by virtue of creating green jobs, et cetera. It occurred to me that that entity in particular said it had no responsibility whatsoever to provide any public information of any kind about what it did and it refused to do so. We had a court case uh, in 2017 that was very similar about another public entity formed in the same way, a non-profit corporation formed by the state performing a government function, and that was Vermont Information Technology Leaders, the, the, the group that collects healthcare information and aggregates it. And it adopted a similar position, and that was litigated in Superior Court in Washington County and uh, the request of the information, uh, it, was, it was concluded that the entity did in fact have to provide that information. And the judge at that case uh, uh, included a series, a, a short series of tests as to what constitutes a public entity for Public Records Act purposes. It included an, uh, an entity that uh, was largely funded by the state, an entity that was created by the state, and an entity that was performing uh, governmental functions, and a couple of other tests. And that's what this bill does uh, as well, is it applies that to uh, overall. It was interesting, as I started looking at how many entities do we have in Vermont that are similarly situated, I couldn't find the answer. I had a, uh, Helena Gardner, if you remember her from Ledge Council, uh, had that as a summer project, and she quit later that summer. I don't know if there was any relationship. <laughs> but uh, Michael O'Grady took it on, and I still haven't got a good report of just how many entities there are that, that fit this test. But what this bill does is it takes Judge Teachout's decision in terms of the criteria to apply and applies it to any entities that fit these, these definitions. We've had, this, this is a recurring problem. You know, people get government money and perform government functions and for some reason want to keep it secret. And I don't think they should. I think the public has a, has a right to know how its money is being used and how people are performing government functions uh, should, be held, should be held accountable. We, we had another a similar situation involving an entirely private entity some years ago, and we have a court decision on that. And you know, the Corporation, Corrections Corporation of America, running private prisons in Vermont, is subject to the Open Records Act under certain, circ certain circumstances based on a Vermont court decision. And again, the logic, again, is very, very similar as to why that should, that should be the case. And that, that's the issue that I'm raising. So, I, I just, if the court had decided in the vital case, which was a similar kind of, wouldn't that apply then? Wouldn't that court decision then apply to this it one might, also? It might or it might not. Okay. Again, that's a decision though that, that was not subject to appeal, and so we don't have a binding decision from the Supreme Court on, okay. on, on the issue. Uh, so there's a lack of clarity. There's also the possibility that uh, an entity that, that meets some of these tests would decide, well, yeah, but that doesn't apply to us because we're, quote, different. Okay. And what this does is it intends to have the legislature take the lead and codify what it is that we want subject to our Open Records Act. And I thought that the, uh, uh, bringing clarity to this was particularly important. So I think that at some point we'll, have, we'll specifically go through this build in and what the definitions are and stuff, but I thank you for, any questions for Senator Brock? Thank, thank you very much. And you. Yeah, so we'll go through it in um, more specific detail later on today. We're just kind of getting all the thoughts out there. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks.
Good afternoon. For the record is Tanya Marshall, State Archivist and Chief Records Officer. I greatly appreciate the invitation to testify this afternoon. Can you just move that a little closer? I can't so we can hear you. Well, and speak right in. Can you yeah, hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I feel like everyone can hear me at this point. Um, I'm just going to, it was open-ended in terms of public records, so mm -hmm. based on um, some testimony last week at House Cup Ops, I kind of framed it. Uh, the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration is charged with administering the statewide records and information management program for all Vermont public agencies in accordance with generally accepted record keeping principles, just like there's accounting principles, there's record keeping principles. Um, and also other industry standards and best practices. The statewide RIM program, um, which calls for sound and effective management of public records and information, regardless of format, by all public agencies is actually cross-referenced in the Vermont Public Records Act in 1 BSA 317A. Um, just briefly, if you're not familiar with the generally accepted record keeping principles, um, I have them listed in the, um, in the handout, but there are, account, there are eight of them, and they're not gonna sound too scary or overwhelming. The first one's accountability, who's responsible for your records at a high level. Transparency, what kind of documentation do you actually have about them and who you can provide it to. Integrity, do you have the right information? Is it correct, is it accurate? Protection, are you protecting information that needs to be protected such as exemptions? Compliance, are you complying with the record keeping laws for which agencies and departments have a lot of them between federal and state statute. Availability, are you making information available to the right people at the right time? Retention and disposition, how long do you need to keep it and how can you destroy it or is it transferred to the state archives? The latter part by law is required for public agencies to actually have permission from the state archivist to destroy a record. Um, so we have a whole process and how record scheduling occurs. As Vermont State Archivist, Chief Records Officer, and the state official who is responsible for directing the SARA, Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, and the statewide RIM program, which is, includes the state archives, I'm in a unique position to discuss many aspects of the PRA, including but not limited to the legislative intent behind the PRA based on the General Assembly's own records. Those are in the state archives. Um, so as you sit there, they'll come into the state archives after the biennium. Um, as well as the records of other public bodies and public officials, particularly around the public's right to inspect or request an agency to provide copies of public records and the public policy, policy of actual costs. Um, the inter and I can also discuss the interrelatedness and dependencies between the management of public records by public agencies and the ability for agencies to effectively respond to public records requests. So your ability to respond and availability principle um, is directly related sometimes to your, to your management. Um, so just two areas I just want to briefly... Can I just ask a question, or maybe you're going to cover? Yeah. We, I know that um, it, some, at some point in the past there were, records were kind of in disarray and it was hard to find something. In fact, when I asked for the original contract between uh, Vermont Yankee and the state of Vermont, it was never found. It just didn't exist anywhere. Greg Sanford looked. It. You're still looking for it. <laughs> he looked for it. Um, for, but, but anyway, have we gotten better? Have our agencies under your direction become better at at these yeah. eight principles? So underneath those generally accepted record keeping principles, one thing that I did not mention that's in my written testimony is that there is actually a model, an industry standard for measuring. And that measurement can go from a scale from one to five, one being substandard and five being transformative, which means that as a government or you know, within the government sector, if you have to apply that scale, um, we're making really good decisions with really good and right information in front of us. Um, so in terms of, you know, in my testimony a little bit later, I can offer to you if you wanted to know the status of public agencies, um, but I think there's some context before I get yeah. asked maybe that question. Yeah. <laughs> that would be great, thanks. Um, so just two things, areas to touch upon. Um, I know that 1 BSA 316 access um, and actual costs has been coming up, it's already came up uh, today. So I just want to point out what the archives can tell us and if there's something you would like me to do to facilitate that, I'm happy to do so. Um, the Vermont State Archives are, um, consist of state public records that have continuing value to the state, state of Vermont and citizens. Vermont archival records document the rights of citizens, the decisions of government, and the history of the state of Vermont. 
These critical public asset, assets also provide context for the decisions and actions of Vermont public officials and agencies, as well as a means for measuring the effectiveness of public policy over time. So the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration on our website, we have a whole continuing issue, what we call a continuing issue series related to the Public Records Act. Um, and it covers the legislative history of the Public Records Act from 1976 through the present. Um, but the records in the archives go beyond that. So one of the things that can provide greater context for the understanding of the PRA um, and 1 BSA 316 specifically and the public's right to inspect or request an agency to provide copies of public records and actual costs um, can be provided to you. I can, I can show you exactly what the committees were discussing at that time, specifically what language means. Um, your records are much more detailed than what you see in the current act and the historical notes that are in the Vermont statutes annotated. Um, so when there is a question, there's, there's a lot to be value, value added by understanding what the committee was actually discussing at that time. Um, this also includes uh, the Uniform Schedule of Public Record Charges for state agencies. That's the rule set by the Secretary of State. That's the rule that sets the cost that agencies can charge when asked to provide a copy of a record. Um, that rule has gone through, for example, the additional records that we have in the state archives that have, when you go through rulemaking, it goes through the legislative um, committee as well as the interagency committee and they have records in the archives too. So it can tell, just tell you what the intent was and also what the intent was understood by those two committees as well as the Secretary of State. So it's much broader um, information within the archives and I'm happy to provide that additional research and also copies of records in the state archives should you be interested in that. Now related to management, um, just for some background, um, just for context, um, I entered the field of archives, records, and information management in pretty pivotal time in, in government record keeping. Um, there had been two federal decisions that came down uh, based on two uh, law cases. One was um, Armstrong versus the um, Executive Office of the President. Um, this was in 1995 and 6, where all of a sudden email was a record. There was an argument that email was not a record, um, and now obviously that, that has a uh, been long decided, and also public citizen versus John Carlin, Archivist of the United States. Uh, that's related to electronic records, electronically stored information, specifically metadata, some additional information that provides context to those who are requesting records or using them even internally. Um, so as a result of that, there was a shift in record keeping. So when I was coming into the field, um, I had really an extraordinary opportunity to, uh, to study under a multidisciplinary team. So it included, although I sit here as state archivist and chief records officer, it actually included national leaders in business, technology records, and legal, including Lee Strickland, um, who was longtime Freedom of Information Act officer for the Central Intelligence Agency, and he was also the former director of information policy at University of Maryland. Um, so it was a pretty exciting time. Um, obviously, public records and information and all the interrelatedness among public record laws, information policy, which is really talking not just about dissemination of records, but the creation and the management and everything leads up to them as a, as a policy, information technology, and also the willingness of public agencies to actively participate in their own information governance has been the focus of my career for 20 years. So now everyone knows how old I am. Um, uh, although I have to tell you, being in the state of Vermont for the last 16, sometimes it feels a little bit like a social science experiment related to public records. Um, but, but I enjoy my job and I, and I love it. So with that in mind, um, as you take testimony on the PRA, I suggest keeping the following in mind. It's not only expected but required for public agencies to manage their records and information in a responsible and effective way. But we shouldn't have to rely on laws to tell us to manage our records and information with purpose. So as public servants, we are here to serve the public and our actions and our decisions should be based on the right information, being given to the right people at the right time, and sometimes that includes the public. Uh, the principles of availability and protection and the general generally accepted record keeping principles go hand in hand. If unable to efficiently provide non-exempt information when requested, there are also equal inefficiencies for providing exempt or protecting exempt information in records as, as required. So if we're having issues providing, because we feel that we have to redact and review and that, I have <laughs> questions about how we're protecting 
that same information. So you, you can't really solve that through lawmaking as much as through information governance and better information security. So just keep that in mind because I do see that a lot of the agencies and departments were a reactive state versus a management state. Um, you know, I take in records from all three branches of state government. They're not even records I've, that we created or produced as the Secretary of State's office. And um, there's many ways that we make it, even though they're not our own records, to make sure that we're providing available records in an efficient and effective way and protecting the exempt records. And that's, that's an information management um, practice. Um, so again, it's not something, the laws are there. Find what you want exempt, you find what you want available. Just know that those two things are principles that need to be, that go together. So if you hear availability issues, then I also get concerned about protection issues. Um, that said, the struggle is real, um, you know, when it comes to public records requests, but it is a symptom of a more systemic problem within the state of Vermont, not the cause of one. So kind of as a state, you know, given my background, given my experience, and given what I've seen in being here, we silo our expertise um, in information management and policy and information <coughs> technology and legal. Um, we don't really collaborate together, and we do this more through bureaucratic and sometimes superficial divisions, or sometimes even personal. You know, elected, appointed officials make a determination not to collaborate for efficiency purposes. And that really makes for failure, um, sets it up for performance and processes issues, technologies that don't work for the requirements that we have. It's just in inevitable. Um, and also in my experience here in the state of Vermont is that you know, records and information management professionals like myself, you know, I could have went on all different tracks, but I chose this one. Um, sometimes we're, we're often underutilized within the state and undervalued. Um, so the question to ask is do you actually have I mean, I went to graduate school and also continued on to a doctoral program, but, uh, so, but didn't, didn't get my doctorate. Uh, but there's, there's, there's that kind of profession, and I don't always see that, and I, it's very rare. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy to provide any additional information related to the statewide records and information management program, our own analyses of the maturity of the internal records management programs within the age, uh, state and local government, because we, we cover both areas, and how and where I allocate my five five records and information management professionals at the state and local government. Um, there is about seven FTEs in the entire state with this job title. Five are on my staff. Um, and we allocate one specifically to AHS um, as a whole just because of the needs there, but they did not have their own full time. And then I also provided some statistics. Uh, I have 18 FTEs total. Um, for the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, and we do a lot of different work. We have the State Archives, we have the State Records Center, we have the Digital Archives. Uh, we do public records, or we do the vital records requests on behalf of the Department of Health. Um, that's where the um, now certified copies of birth and death are regulated. The records of the records remain open for public inspection and copying. Um, in addition, we do the Administrative Procedure Act, runs through our office, um, as well as legislative acts and resolves. Um, so in calendar year of 2019, we did, across all our operations, more than 69,000 records-related transactions. Um, it included 3,356 requests to inspect archival records in the digital archives, 3,142 requests to inspect archival records in the state archives, physical within the vault, we have a reference room for that. 614 requests to inspect records in the record center. This is where an agency is storing something with us, but we are providing the service for them. And 573 requests to provide copies of archival records in the state archives. I'm just curious, uh, Tanya, I'm sorry, the lights are really just driving my <laughs> most recent eye surgery berserk, so I apologize. None of I'm not falling asleep, I'm just trying to see you. Um, the, how, how much time would you equate that into? I mean, that's a, it's wonderful to have those statistics in terms of how the much number time? of requests. How, what's the time frame? Is there an average time frame for, for, the, for, cup, for like when someone makes a request to us to make a copy for something? We do. Yeah, what's your time form? frame? And, and your office, of course, is dedicated to, to this purpose and uh, to providing uh, and opening access to, to public records. 
So it's not like another department that gets asked and isn't necessarily uh, it, it, fully it, it, engaged in this work. Our, as you our purpose are. Is, is for records in the state archives to manage them the same as any public agency would manage. We're just the extension of their records management program. So archival records are a smaller percentage of the big right. set of right. um, public but, records. But do you have an average time frame uh, so that you when we get to have for different types of requests? Sure. Um, so vital record requests, we did about, I don't have it listed here, for certified copies. Um, we did about 6,500 last year. We do that within 24 hours. Uh, copy requests, we have a public uh, reference room that's open 9 to 4, Monday through Friday. Individuals can come in and um, inspect records there. They, they are allowed to do their self-copying. If they use our equipment, they'll get charged for the unif underneath the uniform. They, they can take photographs and they can move on from, from that part of it on their own. Um, so we do have that venue that people come in and then agencies that store records in the record center, which is a separate facility, um, have the option of doing that and we provide the service on behalf. So we usually run that, that room is, um, we have an archivist on call who will come in, you know, into that room when somebody is um, in there and we also have an administrative service. But in terms of just a copy request, um, depending on what it is, legislative audio, for example, is in the state archives. Um, if it's on a reel to reel, which is we're trying to get it converted uh, and get the funding for that, um, an individual has to come in. We do not have the appropriate commit, you know, equipment to make a copy, and that's within the scope of that. However, if they want us to work with them, so that might take, that's not really a copy request, the legislative audio that's on a cassette. Um, that's a real-time duplication, so depending on how many, you know, and we just let the individuals know. We have a lot of great conversations. Um, I'm by background, my master's degree is in library and information science, and so the biggest thing for that particular um, skill set is precision and recall. When someone makes a request to you, one, they often make it um, in, in the form of what they think you have versus what they need. So it has to be part of the dialogue, and the legislature did put that into statute a few years ago based on the recommendation from the Secretary of State's office and my predecessor, Gregory Sanford, because that is a, that's a typical records and information management kind of approach to it. And then precision and recall um, is really about managing your records and getting the records in, um, structured inside the system in an appropriate way and stored in an appropriate way so that when someone does give you a request and you narrow, you're able to <coughs> precision as you're finding exactly what they're looking for. And recall is you're getting everything that you have. There, there's a whole science behind doing that and that is part of records management. So we're able to, unless it's a, a copy request that is just the way the information is that we receive, and it might take a little bit longer, but usually it's within uh, 24 hours. So may I just follow up on, let, let's say it's a reel-to-reel, -reel. let's say it's from the 70s. And so a reel-to-reel -reel from record. the 70s, we or cannot, 80s. yeah, so whenever any reel-to-reel, -reel -reel -reel, we do not have the duplication equipment for it. So, so what, so what would somebody come do, in and listen have, to it? Do you have little booths, mm -hmm. like our foreign language booths where you, we have, um, we, we have like a whole area of like antiquated equipment <laughs> um, that they can, they can listen to it. So, so one of the objectives of the State Archives is to make sure we're preserving and providing access. Um, and that's true for the archival you know, um, profession. So we're always able to provide access. Um, our digital preservation system, which is also serves the digital archives, is, is really incredible because it can bring in almost any file format, even back to WordStar, which predate, you know, predates me, but a lot of uh, government agencies um, in the state of Vermont had WordStar, can bring that in, we can preserve it, we can see what it looked like as it was created by that agency in 1988, but we can actually render access through a current means such as Adobe. Um, so there's a lot of capabilities for that. So when we can provide access, that's our key part. If we're able to provide a copy, if someone has asked for us to provide a copy, it's dependent on the equipment that we have and the format that the record is in. And, and just to finish, when you say our, our, our office is designed and managed to, uh, to enable people uh, accessing public records, and, and so you're saying the time you didn't really Say about the average time is it sounds like the time is minimal given that's what you're designed to do 
Well, given that's how we, we manage our materials. Right, exactly. So, I, you know, the difference would have been buildings and general services prior to 2008 and the creation of Vermont State Archives and Records Administration was not only the, the records management part of it, but technically the state archives, because the Secretary of State's office was only responsible by statute for the preservation of governor's records and legislative records. So all the other records were kind of left to their own. Um, so they did get into Middlesex and so forth, but those records were just as is, as they come in. So part of our work is to make them more accessible, make sure that we're managing them, and also preparing because we do get recent records and we have a number of agencies ready to do transfers that we are watching to make sure that they're managed appropriately so we do not get inundated with an unexpected um, situation where there's exempt or not really clear what, what information is and how we manage. So. Yeah, so right now it's because, it's not because it's magical. We're, we're, we're applying our records and information management skills to make that real effective. We have a records management system that manages the whole space and all the records in that. Those are tools available um, that, that we do, and that's the broader part that we'd like to have and see for the rest of the state of Vermont. <coughs> I'm wondering about uh, digitization of records. So mm -hmm. do you scan? paper documents and turn them into digital records, or do you always keep original paper records? So the, we digitize certain sets of records. For example, the legislative uh, real to real tapes, that's an issue right now where access is really dependent on old equipment. So we, we would design that to try to get that digitized, and we're currently looking for funding for that. As a whole, it's much more for our operations as well. We have paper, analog, and digital records. Our focus is digital, born digital records and ensuring that those are preserved um, in an appropriate way. And then when we digitize, one of the things, the cost, it has to be a return on investment for that. It is much more costly to preserve a, one, say, cubic foot with baker box of records. It's more costly to preserve it electronically if you expect the preservation and access and availability to happen. It's cheaper for my $2 than it might be to sit on a shelf. Um, so we really play those by ear. One thing that we're going to be pushing out this year um, based on certain parameters is a request for one is a request for all. So, um, and that means like if we do digitize something in response to a public records request, which is most common, almost all our things are public records requests for it. maybe it's a, a paper record, we digitize it, we pass it on to the agency or the, the requester for that. And then pushing that into our digital preservation system and making it available online if there's no uh, redaction. But the cost, the, the return on investment for some of that is actually not there. Sure. Um, so our priority would be using our funds for born digital because we're not going to print those out. That's actually more efficient. And when you're digitizing, do you use something like optical character recognition? Are you creating, are you able to extract we, data out of it? Yeah. Keyword them or? What we do is um, there's, there's national and international standards related to digitization in terms of record key, like metadata that's associated with that. And then, yes, it would be, you know, it would include the, if it's a paper document and we're scanning it, it would include the full text component of it, and then it also include other attributes that uh, make sure that the record can be accessible. And yeah, so there's different standards that we follow that are related to records and information management. And then just the last piece of this is, as more and more things are created online, do you uh, in some way retain the ability to see those online forms? I mean, they, wouldn't, they once would have been a paper document, but now we're pulling it online, and then it actually flows into a database. So I'm just wondering how much of that data stays available in what form for right. how long? So one of our charges underneath um, our statute is that the statewide records and information management program includes life cycle management for records. So creation, management, that's going to be with the public agency, archival records, and have the ability to be transferred to us. Um, so in terms of elect foreign digital records, the key part for a digital preservation system is that whole gamut of that and there's a process by which agencies can use that you know transfer records for us um, into there but there's electronic records have been you know databases are very difficult um, in some ways because you can bring the whole database in but you want to actually be able to show the functionality that people have been using it 
Um, so one of the things we've been looking at is how, you know, with even the Secretary of State's office, we have corporations, we have corporation records, we have this whole database. You know, we, I can bring the object into the digital archives and preserve it, but the functionality is still a big research area that's happening right now internationally to make sure that the user experience and the ability to know that this data was associated with this content and this is how it was related together. Um, and be able to have someone access it the same way. Um, but right now we've been doing it with our digital preservation system with some um, not as sophisticated systems from the past that state government used. So I don't know if that helps answer your question or. Sure, I mean, it sounds like a big challenge. I'm sorry. It sounds like a big challenge because over time, uh, the software, the front yeah. end will become more and more obscure and the data sits back. Right. And you're going to have to so the digital it. preservation system that we use, um, the state of Vermont was one of, I think, six or seven states that was part of a large federal project starting in 2007. And so the key part was that it's, it's the system that actually buys all the proprietary formats. Um, and it also can tell us, because there's some fonts, if you're using a certain system and there's a font, that font might be proprietary. So as you're using it, all of a sudden the next day the font has the proprietary uh, the license expired and all of a sudden the document's blank. Um, so there's, a, there's, a, there's actually a lot of really interesting, which I don't want to take a, I could talk about it for hours, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you're welcome to come and visit. But those are the kinds of challenges. So when I put on my state archivist hat, those are the things that, you know, even in addition that we're trying to make sure um, can, can issue show that the public record and archival records of the state are well-preserved and accessible. Thank you. I just want to understand something in terms of where you come into the picture. If I make a request of something related to the DCF or the Agriculture Department or something, mm -hmm. but it goes back in time, I guess you're going to be, the, it's not the Ag Department's Ag Agency staff that's doing the work, it's your folks that are doing the work. Right, so. And then they send it to the Ag Department, and I go into the Ag Department, sit down with them, and they say, look, here's what we found for you, but actually, right. your so folks did the work. We can respond to public records requests if that particular department has transferred its older records into the state archives. Um, what we often do, because we operate the State Record Center, and that is often the case where some records have been over time, is, um, and we kind of walked into a facility that was already operational. We will work with the records officer from that particular agency to try to ensure that we're trying to find. So there's a collaboration that occurs when there's the search for older materials that may have, um, you know, the current staff don't know what happened. It could have been in the record center prior, you know, for a number of, I mean, we have things in the record center that have been there for 60 or 70 years. Um, that we are working with the agencies on identifying and making sure that gets transferred. But how is the soonest that things get to your folks? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. How soon do things get to your folks? Like if, I, if I'm looking at it for a records request of something that happened five years ago, is that going to be um, It depends on the records, the life, how soon it will get into the archives. Yeah. Um, it depends on the record schedule. So the record schedule covers the life cycle of the document. So we get some records, um, a good example is the legislature right after the biennium right. this in the summer. Your legislative records for this biennium are coming into the state archives. <coughs> we handle the public records request for that as soon as they come on transfer. Uh, Governor leaves office the day that the uh, inauguration occurs, that switch happens. Um, so it really just depends on um, what we don't do and we schedule the records is that if there's a requirement for the agency that the record's going to change or a case could be reopened and they have some other dependencies on that record, that's not a good criteria for transfers to the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. So do you, um, I know that this is your business, but do you ever charge people to find a... To find? To... Yeah, to no, I come I mean, in and all I All charges ask. are done underneath the, the Secretary of State's office sets the uniform charges for state right. agencies, but, and it's based on providing the physical copying of a record. Um, so we follow the our own Secretary of State rule for that. So it is physically, so when we charge, it will be based on that rule. If we were at the copier for more than 30 minutes, for example, in <coughs> a large file, then there will be a charge associated after the 30 minutes based on the uniform schedule. So if I if I came in and I asked, I, I just want to see this thing, but it takes you four hours to find it. It wouldn't take us four hours to find something. Um, I, I, I mean, yeah. 
So uh, some I know because your records are they're good. Up. I mean, well, right. there's there's possible that we can't find something, and we would never charge. And I think there's individuals probably here who who have been in our facility and have come to our reference room and, and can kind of explain that we will do our best to find it based on the tools that we have. Um, there there isn't always clarity that you know again for something that's in the state archives. For for example, if someone was looking for a legislative report. We itemize as much as we can how it came from Ledge Council into us, but if, if it's not where it's supposed to be, and we have exhausted all efforts, but we don't charge for that that at all. And would it be, there isn't even a provision for charging for that. And yours are already set up so that anything that had to be redacted was is redacted already, or if you had to go through and redact, spend a certain amount of time redacting, would you charge me for that? No, for that time, and I don't. We don't charge for redacting now. Okay, it's not within the uniform but, schedule. But they're also not in a position to. Oh, we have. You we are. Have. Oh, because the records because we of have the privacy thing. The records yeah. that we have in the state archives span all three three branches of government and um, include you know records that are exempt. Um, there's different ways that we work on when there's a transfer. So if it's a paper record keeping system within the agency and department, so maybe we're taking records that they have been maintaining paper. Um, as part of our records and information management specialists being out there with the agencies and trying to work with them to make sure that they're managing their records effectively, there's going to be a segregation. Um, so that's best filing practices related to segregation. Um, we also, in the scheduling process, identify every single legal requirement, record keeping requirement, around a set of records. Um, so if we're aware, for example, that a certain set of records uh, require a social security number on a particular form that we know we're coming into the archives, we know exactly where that's going to be located and how, and when we get that records request, um, there's two things that we do. We're pretty transparent in letting people know that there's exemptions on the records up front. So oftentimes when we do get the request, people are asking us more, can I have a copy or can I see something that is not exempt? Um, and then if we redact, we're redacting right at the copying process. I would love some time to just get from you, the not right now, but the list of the uh, where the different agencies and departments sure. are in terms of your one to five we scale. We have to provide that to you. And then if you wanted information or legislative history related to um, any of the parts of the Public Records Act, you're welcome. I just have one more for the okay. So you did 69,000 transactions in 2019. Is that a steady kind of number or is it going up? Um, that number is going, has gone down a little bit, um, only because there's been some changes. So the biggest change probably is related to more to vital records. Um, so one of the things prior to that, we're, we're kind of an extension of the Department of Health. And um, those records, uh, the paper birth and death certificates are now in the record center versus um, yeah, it, it's just more on, uh, on the finessing of their, their records in the record center. So in terms, they haven't asked us not to provide access to them through them. They'll handle them through their own public records requests, whereas prior to the change in the law, those records were being more widely used for our facilities. So those numbers have gone down. But on average, we're about between 70,000 and 80,000. Um, I know the expungement, um, some of our transactions are providing copies back to the agencies. So the microfilm program in the state of Vermont was pretty rampant <laughs> um, and you know underneath some of the expungement laws you know sometimes our copy requests to provide copies back to the agencies of their own records can be up into eight, eight or nine thousand pages a month um, so those have been we've been working with like the judiciary and others to try to bring that down to a realistic um, provision because it, it just wasn't a good um, approach and the legislature passed a law to kind of facilitate that thank you mm -hmm. and just if, if I could just tag on to um, Anthony's question about when agencies uh, and departments and the judiciary send you their records. It, with the legislature, it's very clear. We have an end of session. It's easy, and we send everything over after that. But is there a, a rule of thumb for everybody else, like a year or can, six months? Or? Can I suggest that you give us that chart at some point, and then we not? Yeah. yeah. Because that really... Where, wherever they reside doesn't, the public records request the scheduling is scheduling process made. is based on a record yeah. of completely different factors. Yeah. And I can provide an overview at a different time for that. Okay, because right. the, the request for the public record 
whether it exists with you or with the agency is a request for a public record. So whenever they transfer is irrelevant to the request. Well, no, it, yeah. Yes and no. It sounds like you're perfectly set up to deal with these requests. If, if your question is more that, yes, we have a lot of agencies that are very anxious to make sure their schedules can show a transfer to the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration or destruction. And, and that's our advice, too. If yeah. we don't need to have, maintain records longer than we we need to, that's that's within from, you know, the State Archivist's purview to put that into the schedule. And that actually facilitates accessibility. And then if we're not having to search through a bunch of stuff, that isn't necessary to do so, and the public agency is able to clear out unnecessary information, that's pretty right. efficient. Thank you. thank you, Tanya. Oh, thank you. Chris, we have you on the list. Deputy Commissioner, we have you on the list next. I still want to hear from you. <laughs> and I'm, I guess you didn't want to take us to dinner. <laughs> I would make that inference, Madam Chair. <laughs> For the record, I'm Chris Herrick, Deputy Commissioner of Public Safety. Um, I can tell you that uh, 35 years ago when I started firefighter training, the last thing I thought I'd be doing is testifying about the uh, administration of public records requests in front of this committee, but here we are. This is a, I should give you a little background. Um, over at the Department of Public Safety, the responsibility of responding to public records requests falls in my portfolio. And so um, almost every one of the ones that we issue comes across my desk in one way or another. Um, last year, I, I just ran a report this is a listing of all the public records requests that we filled last year. W would you like to take a guess how many the department did last year? Well, it looks like you have about 10 pages there. I would guess about um, 2,000. Anybody? Well, I'll tell you what, if you guess it within 50, I'll buy you dinner. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't guess. Uh, 6,320. Oh, you're over. 4,598. So if you take out weekends and holidays, that works out to about 18 a day. Hmm. Now, to be fair, some of these uh, require uh, about an hour's worth of time, and some of them require up to 40 or 50 hours of time because they can require, they, they involve uh, hundreds of pages of documentation and we're required by statute to remove any reference DII, any victim information in most cases. And so the redacting process takes a very long time and this includes both uh, paper or electronic, you know, written um, exhibits but also video and audio. And so we spend uh, a fair amount of time doing this. And, and um, I had one, we have one person assigned to this. This is their full time job. And right now, the two days before you came back, she left for another job. So it's perfect timing. Um, but I spend probably 10 to 15% of my time on public records, as does our general counsel. Um, a lieutenant from the state police probably spends 25% of his time, if not more, and there's another full-time person um, who works on these. We have a constant uh, backlog, but we, we try to get them out. Uh, we do get them out as timely as we can. Um, so, I'm not sure if that's helpful or not. Uh, I do know um, I couldn't get the exact number, but I believe the Department of Public Safety handles roughly 60% of all public records requests for state government. Really? That's, yes ma'am. So, uh, Chris, do you, uh, municipal departments, I mean, you handle public safety requests for the public safety crowd that fall under your purview, which are the state police, 
but you don't you don't handle the public records requests for individual municipal departments. So no, it gets complicated though. Yeah. But no, let, let me start with the easy part of that. So we most of our public records requests are for the state police, uh, the division of fire safety, emergency management, homeland security, uh, the forensics lab. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, the VCIC, the criminal investigation, uh, criminal investigation. Yeah. You know what I mean. And um, the marijuana dispensary as well. In terms of a municipal uh, request, um, sometimes the, the, part of the state police is asked to investigate a municipal yeah. happening. Um, and so then they become our records and their records and we will get the request right and so um, but generally speaking if it's a um, for instance Burlington Police Department has an incident uh, that does not involve any state police then they will own the records and they're responsible for the man so you to answer your question um, yeah we don't do generally municipal and, and, and just to finish on that, the, the vast majority, I assume, are with the, yes, with the Vermont State Police. That's correct. Yeah. Chris, did you have your hand up? Oh, oh, thank you. So, uh, up to this point, have you, do you charge anything for um, when I come in and I ask for some kind of a record and um, when I ask for it, do I say to you, I want to look at it or I want a copy of it? Um, so, do you, would you charge me for anything that took a long time? Let me clarify your question. Yeah, I'm not sure I asked it right. But. Um, if you're asking, uh, as a typical public records request, we're going to provide the documentation to you, whether we send it to you electronically or in the mail, um, we have the option. And if it's excessive, I mean, if it's an awful lot of time, we'll send you back saying, hey, it's going to take us 25 hours, and this is how, how much it will cost, less the amount of time that we're allowed or required to give um, for you. And then we'll negotiate with you. Maybe you'll narrow your scope, mm -hmm. which happens often. And it, it's actually a valuable tool to be able to do that. Uh, because if somebody, and I'm going to answer your question, I swear no. I am. Um, but if, if somebody sends it, hey, I want every police report for the last six months. Oh, that's going to take us 100 hours and it's going to cost you X amount of dollars. Would you like to narrow your scope? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd like every police report written by Officer Herrick in the town of Grand Isle for that time. Okay. If you want to come in and inspect the records, the same time frame will exist, but we won't charge you. We don't, it, it, we're not going to charge you if you want to come in and take a picture of that record um, or anything like that. So the distinction is um, whether you want to inspect it. Even if you had to re go through and redact information? We're not, that's correct. You're not going to charge? We're not allowed to. The, I, I see that now. I, I don't think I ever understood that. I, so why, I guess this isn't a question for you, but we have, I felt we had a chart someplace that you can charge this amount per hour for certain people and this amount per hour if it's somebody else, but we're not going to have, if we're charging only for the actual copying of it, we're not going to have the secretary of the, of the agency doing the copying. So, so we do don't do charge job? for, the, I mean, the fee is based, there is a, a calculus for it. Yeah. And it's, we can charge for staff time right. for the redaction. Right, okay. Because that's where the time really is. That's for, but that's the preparation. Yeah. And, and we can, you, you charge for that whether if somebody is just inspecting or. No. So not if, if they're not, if they're just inspecting, you do not. And turn. you have to redact. You don't do it. You don't. We still have to redact, no matter how but the information is presented. That's correct. So time for inspecting cannot be charged. Well, yeah, that's right. 
But if you give it to me and I take it home to read it, then you can charge me for it? Because Correct. Okay. And you can charge for the time of redacting it? Correct. That makes no earthly sense at all. But, but I mean, you still are spending the time. I, I will say, I think it, it, it harkens back to a different time. When somebody says, hey, I want to come in and inspect, and they can sit and go through a record. But the laws have changed when that was from when that was an original written. But um, even then, you had to redact certain information. Yeah, I don't think the redaction um, policies were as stringent, but I wasn't around back then. What if I came in and said, I want to see the video of this. I want to see the body cam from this or the video mm -hmm. of that. That, there's a lot of information on those that I should not see. Correct. But I just tell you I want to watch it. I don't want a copy of it. We would still have to uh, go through and redact and portions of it that, you know, perhaps there's a license plate of a person not involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other part I should say is, is this even part of an ongoing investigation? And that, that's just a whole other set of rules and nobody's really going to get at that mm -hmm. But we do need to redact it if there are innocent or not involved folks in there. We need to, you know, not the blue dot anymore, but we pixelize faces right. and uh, remove voices too of people that should not be heard. So if I ask you for a copy of that video, you'll charge me for that time. Correct. But if I say I want to just come into the headquarters and look at it once you've redacted, you're not going to charge me for that time. Correct. <coughs> well, I guess from now on, no one will ever ask for a copy. I know, we're going to make an office for some people I know who might be sitting in the room. Okay. Oh, no, I did have one more question. Uh, there is the... You have the equipment necessary to copy the records. I, I mean, you have a copier and you have the equipment that would be needed to sure. make whatever copies. Sure. And I'm just reading here and it says a public agency having the equipment has, has to utilize its own equipment. And if it doesn't have the equipment, it doesn't have to, nothing shall be considered to require the agency to use or permit the use of copying equipment other than its own. Okay, I guess that's a question for some other people. Well, we have, we have. You have it, so. Yeah, and, and to be honest, some of our um, documents are just electronic. Yeah. We would like to get to a point where we're paperless, frankly. It's easier to redact that way. Yeah. Um, if you have it electronically. Okay. But yeah, we, that doesn't seem to apply to us. Yeah, okay, thank you. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you. And when we get um, when we get farther here, I think we need to talk a little. We want to talk a little bit more about the dispensaries and what is public and what isn't. Can I? Sorry, Chris. Uh, no. Oh, oh, you have. Yeah, no. Just one with Chris. Oh. So, do you have a, a notion of the of how you translate your forty five hundred ninety eight requests into time? So I haven't done that analysis and. Um, it would take a lot of time to do, but I think one of the things that I want to start doing is, as a, it's a new year, tracking. is tracking time, and we may be doing that, and I don't have it in with this, and I, I would, this was printed, um, but I may be able to go back and figure it out, do an average, to do a percentage of how many are, you know, crash reports that are, you know, that insurance companies are looking for, um, and how many are the various types. So right. uh, I'll look and see what I can do in terms right. of an in-depth analysis on that. That is a public records request. <laughs> it is. <laughs> that I just made. Great. <laughs> Make that 4,599. You just want to get closer so you win dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks Thank again. You. Thank you. Steve, you're next on the list. And we have um, actually TJ by phone at some point after three. Everybody else is here. Okay. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon. The record, Steve Howard, I'm the executive director of the BSEA. I don't have too much to say. There's a few things just to identify, I think, just in general about public records. Um, the first thing I think the most important thing that BSEA would like to convey is that uh, we steadfastly stand by the exemption from the right of the public to have access to personnel records. Uh, and we understand that that's going to be an issue this year that probably will be discussed in the legislature. Uh, it's a battle we're probably going to uh, wage with the administration. Is there some kind of a bill about that? or is There isn't a bill. There is discussion about uh, confidentiality of, defense, of uh, personnel records, particularly around discipline. Uh, and our view is that uh, our members have a right, public employees have a right uh, to um, maintain privacy, that uh, they have a right to have the discussion about disciplinary issues between the between uh, the employee and the employer, and that it not be something that's, you know, uh, we shouldn't be handling disciplinary issues, personnel issues in the press, for instance. Uh, it would not happen with other private employer employees. We don't think it should happen with public employees. So we would ask the committee, to, if that does become an issue, to resist that. Um, I think that's that's uh, an issue that we think is, is important. Uh, in general, we support uh, widespread access to public records, as much information as we can get at the cheapest price we can get it. Um, we have had some issues in the past, I think, with agencies not allowing us to use our cell phones to take pictures of documents, um, which has been somewhat of an issue for us. But um, with the exception of personnel records, generally we weigh it on the side of uh, more access at the lowest possible cost. Um, and I, it was interesting to hear some of Senator Brock's testimony. Uh, the one area where we have had some struggle, in, um, in particular around getting access um, to information, is around entities that are um, provided, the private entities that were created by the state government, essentially, uh, and they operate in state buildings uh, doing state functions, and they're funded through a state grant. And as such, they, their position is that they are not subject to the Freedom of Information Act. Um, so we think that's an issue that needs to be addressed, that the public has a right to know um, um, how, my, how that grant is being used, how, how those funds are being expended, what their effectiveness is. And we have been told, denied access to that information. Do you, in um, connection with uh, Senator Brock, <coughs> Bill, do you, he lists a very specific fund there, but do you want to sometime give us a list of who those people are? I, I'd be happy to, and I actually will. I have not read Senator Brock's bill uh, in detail, yeah, but just, we would be happy to provide that. Okay, but it, they would meet those criteria that he's laid out probably. They could, yeah, they could. They're likely to. Yeah. Um, is there a line between the sort of entities you're talking about and uh, just private vendors hired by the state to do work? And if so, how do you choose where to draw the line in terms of access to information? I think that's a good question. I don't know that I know the answer to it. Um, I do think if, uh, if, there's a, if there's an entity that is performing essentially the same work as state employees and they are occupying state space, and they were created by a state agency. Um, that may rise to a different level than just any vendor for the state. Um, but I, th I think it's a good question, and I, I don't have a definitive answer for you, but it, it depends on the degree of state involvement, I think. As we go forward with Senator Brock's bill, if you have suggestions around what those um, criteria would be, that would be great. Sure, I'd be happy to provide that. Allison, did you have a question? No, I just, I'm just curious if there have been public records requests on, uh, on uh, personnel records, given that you raised it as a concern. Have, have those been made? In the history of state government, uh, I'm sure there have been. No, but in uh, your time as executive director of the SEN. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't recall off the top of my head. Okay. I think this is the first uh, sort of open discussion of um, the uh, availability of, of personnel records. I'm sure it's possible in the seven, it's possible in the seven years that I've been doing this that it's happened, but I, I, this is the first time 
it's really risen to the level where I'm made aware of it. I've been, I've been made aware of it. I believe that we address this a little bit um, around teachers and around um, law enforcement officials a few years ago. And then it's a balancing act. But yeah. everything is. But I, it is a balancing act because, you know, state employees are Vermont State Police also, and they're on video camera, their, their behavior is possibly open and often open to a public records request. So their behavior is experienced. It's just interesting to... Yeah, it's very complicated. It's, it's, I mean, well, I think the I issue mean, is... Video how do you... in a correctional facility, for example, is, is a public record, conceivably, in terms of looking at your personnel and not necessarily the personal record, but being able to see a, 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 a VSEA member in action. But anyway, we've yeah, no, it's it. not. But yeah. it could a disciplinary it issue could be, like, be related a, to that. An investigative report. Yeah. You know, it's hard. I think the difficulty is if it, once you ring the bell, it's hard to unring the bell, and when people's reputations are in, at stake. Yeah. Um, we have to be very cautious about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for the record, Madam Chair, any time you or any of your guests want to go to Sardu Cheese, I am happy to bring you. Just not to pay for it. I will have yeah. it. Have you, going to Sardu Cheese with the chair is a blast. And I can only imagine what it would be like with, uh, <laughs> with Gail and company. <laughs> and Tucker. And Tucker. That would be fun. Thank you. Do I need to say my name? Yes. 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 For the Patricia Gabo, I'm the Vermont State Court Administrator. And I don't have prepared remarks, but I thought I would just do a reframing mm -hmm. that uh, the judiciary is a separate branch of government and handles public records issues um, through rules adopted by the Supreme Court. And very recently, this past summer, after a very deliberative process, uh, the judiciary adopted new rules for public access to court records. And part of that was simply because it was time to take a look, but it was particularly motivated by the fact that we are um, transitioning from being a paper-based system for our case records to an electronic-based system. And so what uh, the committee that handled this, and there is a standing committee in the judiciary, not only did had many, many meetings, but also uh, conducted public outreach for comment and had a public hearing uh, in the pavilion. And so these are brand new rules. Um, they, um, we're, we're still in the process of getting used to them because in the old days, <laughs> under the former rules, if someone wanted to look at a case record, it was a paper file, you had to go to the place where the paper file was and the like. Now that we will transition into electronic records, the court administrator becomes the custodian of those records and developing a, a process uh, to make sure that all records requests are handled appropriately will happen in this electronic world. So we're very much, as we're configuring for our case management system, uh, including that in there. The other thing I might mention, uh, I heard some other people talk about um, how the requests have increased. And I can say in the short term, that I've been court administrator, which I think now is six years, requests for public records, copies of public records have increased dramatically. And so that's actually become a, a big part of my job, and that's under the old rules. <laughs> so um, we will, part of our structure will be to try and make sure that we can continue to handle those requests in accordance with uh, the new rules. And the, the kinds of issues that we deal with not only are the issues of making sure we re redact mm -hmm. records that are, um, should be redacted, we have files that are completely confidential or we have things in a file that are confidential. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done and we're hoping over time that redaction software will be of assistance with that. That is developing now and so that's something we're uh, looking into. And the other thing that weighs heavily on us generally regarding um, the whole issue of open records is the way the world is changing so that more and more private information becomes weaponized against people and, and looking at how can we be accountable 
in all ways and provide more data so that people can see we're doing our job right and the criminal justice system is operating correctly and yet avoid inadvertently um, contributing to the weaponizing of personal information. I think that's uh, a threshold futures question and I'm only you know, beginning to think about that now as we start to you know, develop our practices and, and procedures for public records. Do you charge? So if someone, at, I think it's not dissimilar, so if someone asks for a copy of a paper record that we have now, mm -hmm. uh, we will charge the cost of copying. I think our rates are the same as established by the Secretary of State. We do not charge if someone wants to take a photograph <coughs> of a public record, and at the moment we're not charging for redaction. So we will, we have all the same issues that other people do. Uh, so we, we didn't have authority for that. So it's a similar thing. Once phones came around, you know, there, I suppose the question would have presented, is that a copy or not? But we made an administrative determination that it wasn't a copy, and, and so we had to charge for that. Right? So you don't charge redacting, even no, though that might take a lot of time? Right, so if, if someone comes and says, we want to look at the record, and again, it's easier to talk about it in paper, right? Because <laughs> that's established. What will happen is the, we can't just give the record. So we'll have to say, we'll we look at it, oh, we need to redact, or we don't need to redact, and then we will either produce the document after redaction, or we do have a procedure with paper records where when things come in, the court is supposed to segregate. I think it's pink or red folders. So in a paper world, the, the paper that's m most likely to be available for public access is in one file, and if we know ahead of time when we're getting something in that it's either it's a juvenile case or it's a medical file in a, you know, in a, in a different kind of a case, they're supposed to be segregated to make it easier for the clerks to do that. And so the challenge we have now as we're developing our system is how are we going to translate that into an electronic world? The other um, thing that's a little bit unique about the rules adopted by the court is that in an electronic world, we put the responsibility initially on the filer not to file things um, that are exempt from access. And so documents shouldn't have social security numbers or the like uh, when, because there are ways that you could, if those were relevant to the case, you might provide them separately or under seal. However, the court, meaning me, the, not the court, the court administrator, also has the responsibility to review those records. And so if, I'm, if you're filing a case, you're told ahead of time, don't give me the following thing, social security, whatever else is in there. But I also, under the rules, have a responsibility or my designee to uh, review everything that gets filed to make sure that something doesn't become part of the public record it shouldn't. I will predict that notwithstanding those double protections, that there will still end up being information that shows up in the public record that shouldn't be there just because right now it's humans, <laughs> people are human, and, and we don't know yet whether the redaction software is reliable enough to take care of that. So that just leads me to ask uh, the difference, the time difference between redacting a paper file and redacting a digital file. There's software to redact a digital file that doesn't destroy, uh, you know, the uh, the digital integrity of the file. Yeah. So there is there is in the marketplace, and that takes less time. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So time. there is in the marketplace redaction software, and so our research in redaction software is that it may not necessarily be ready for prime time, but it's on the cusp of being ready for prime time, and. Obviously, once you had a reliable electronic way to provide a redacted copy mm -hmm. of uh, a document and you were confident and trusted it, that would be the best of all worlds. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so again, we're in the middle of the project and the technology is changing quite fast. So our hope is that that will exist, but um, what we've been doing is thinking of our rollout 
basically we're rolling out a case management system. We've already rolled out the Judicial Bureau and we'll be rolling out the Southeast region. We call it the WOW region, Windsor, Wyndham, and Orange. And we'll be doing that within the next two months. The, the first priority is that the case management system itself work. <laughs> and, and that's sort of the behind the scenes piece. And so we'll be using that region as a pilot to deal, how are we gonna deal with different kinds of requests for records once they're electronic. And so there'll be a period of time where it won't be wonderful, but we'll be using that as an opportunity to see what's the best way to handle those kinds of things. And you may be aware that there are statutes that prohibit us from putting um, online criminal family and probate case information. And so we will, as the, once the rollout is mature, have ways that people can come to the courthouse to view electronic copies of those, but it won't be online or someone sitting in, you know, in, in their living room in their pajamas looking at it. And that in itself, you know, dealing with the difference between making sure that media have the access they need to do their work, but also at the same time making sure that people who are unrepresented litigants or lawyers in the courthouse have access to certain kinds of records. All those things uh, are part of this pilot period where we try and come up with different ways to deal with that. And it's likely that it'll be different in different courthouses depending on what kind of usage is made in that courthouse and what the traffic is and the like. So more to come. More questions and answers right now. Our courts are very excited. Our court thing with Brownsboro. Yes, no, we're, uh, we, um, we were, um, we chose strategically in terms of the t where to roll out, and we felt that there was an excitement and enthusiasm in that region. The wow. We were ready to go. The wow courthouse. Wow. I'm, I'm worried that after the rollout, we'll be going, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but we feel, we feel pretty, we know, we know from our experience with the Judicial Bureau that. We learned a lot from our Judicial Bureau rollout, and so we've done a lot of things in advance of this rollout. I think that will do us well, but as most people know who've gone through technology transformations, it isn't like you just turn on the light switch and suddenly the lights are on and everybody says, great, the lights work. It really is, it's a project, everybody's involved, obviously people in the court, but even the users of the court are part of the project as they give us feedback and, and we engage them in you know, what's working and isn't working. So we, um, uh, you know, we appreciate the collaboration of you know, everybody and the understanding and patience of everybody as we do that. Are your rules for how you deal with um, public record requests yeah. public? Yes. Could we get a copy of those? Again? Sure, they're right on the website okay. and I could okay. send you a, a link. Yeah. And okay. they're brand new rules. Right. Yeah. So I, the first time I, so I participated in some of the committee hearings, but there were so many I couldn't go to them all. So I finally had a flight that I took and I actually brought the book with me and read them all through since I'm the custodian of the electronic records. So it seemed like I really better know what's in there. <laughs> Any more questions for Matt? Thank you. Thank you Great. again. Thank you. Thank you for coming back. <coughs> Concoct we something for tomorrow. Um, so, Anne is not here, I don't think, unless she's hiding somewhere. John? Good afternoon. Thanks for this opportunity to testify about this. So, for the record, I'm John Grobman. I'm the Policy and Water Program Director for the Vermont Natural Resources Council. And, and um, so in, in the vein of just having listened to everybody talk, I just hope to share some of my perspective on this issue. And obviously you're trying to figure out what of anything that you uh, want to do in terms of legislation. So my perspective is um, I've been a general counsel of a state agency. I was general counsel of the Agency of Natural Resources and I responded to many record requests. And I've, I work now for VNRC. And I worked for VNRC in the past, so I've been a requester of documents. And then VNRC was also, um, we were an amicus party to the Doyle case. So we were involved with that case. Um, 
and we're pleased with the decision. And I'll give an example of kind of why we got involved with that case and kind of how that came to be. So that's just kind of where I'm coming from on that. And so both from being within state government and outside state government, you know, it's just to state the obvious that um, the ability to access documents um, and understand what's happening in government is just crucial to, for a government to work well and for the democracy to work well. And, um, you know, I'm pleased to say when I was in state government, um, you know, we, we got lots of record requests, some big, some small, but we took them very seriously. And uh, it was important to let people know what was happening and what was the basis of our decisions. And we would go through the records, you know, for against the exemptions. And in, in our world, at, at the Agency of Natural Resources, they were mostly attorney-client privilege issues. Um, and we withheld documents that protected that privilege um, because it's also important to make sure that um, people could get their advice from their attorneys. And But documents that were not subject to any of the exemptions, we, we provided them. And we never charged anybody while I was at a and R. Um, and while I was at a and and since I've left a and um, you know, when I was there, I think one of the reasons why you know, we didn't charge people, we had a pretty good record management system there based on the technological advancements that we have you know, seen in society. And it's only improved since then. And so we get a request that we come in, and most of the requests we got were for emails and, and some documents, but staff could search very quickly. They were able to search very quickly, identify the documents. People would just shoot me over files. Um, you know, we viewed the lawyer work of redacting documents as, you know, we're already paying the lawyers to be there at the agency, and that was, you know, and as I said, attorney-client privilege is, was really the main exemption that we dealt with. And we um, just viewed that as part of the work of being a lawyer who worked at a government agency is to go through the documents. Um, and then we would be able to provide, you know, files on FTP sites and, and really pretty quickly get the information of people and not charge them. Um, since I've been back at BNRC, I've, I've submitted a number of record requests to my for, former agency, and I, I have to say that, that they've done a really good job in responding to them. Um, I have not been charged, although I understand that they now do sometimes charge, and I'm not clearly clear on when and, and why, but I have not been charged for any requests that I've, I've submitted to them. And I've gotten the FTP site files, just like I described to you, and it's been, a, I think, a, a process that works well. Since I've been back at VNRC, I've also submitted a lot of requests to the Agency of Agriculture. So this is kind of the contrast I have. And so the requests I've submitted to the Agency of Agriculture have all resulted in um, significant charges and estimations of charges and long negotiations about the charge um, and delays in getting those documents. And what I see is a difference between a and and the Ag Agency. And the requests are often for similar things. It was in our world, and Senator Bray knows this very well, you know, big issue is water quality and you know, um, the impact of you know, farm pollution on water quality. So we would submit a and record requests about that, and then Ag and the Ag Agency, and uh, the Ag Agency would say, well, we don't have enforcement records, um, you know, we don't have specific enforcement files, so we have to look at every file for every farm, and that's gonna take us a long time. And we, one of the bills we got was for about $550. Now, we whittled that down after a negotiation. And then the Conservation Law Foundation that we work with often just submitted a, a request, and they got a bill for $1,500. And so, you know, VNRC, when we get a bill for $500, I mean, if it's an important issue we're working on and it's something that, you know, uh, is um, in our work plan and we plan for, we, you know, we can absorb that cost, although it's not something we knew we were going to have to pay for, and we certainly, it's, it's a bit of a hit, you know, because it was not in the budget. But it makes me think that ordinary citizens, I think, how could they pay $550, $1,500? to get access to basic documents when I see these two different agencies working, one not charging us, one charging us, and the big difference I see is record management. The big th thing I see is that a &R has used their IT staff to figure out a way 
to basically create electronic files and they don't feel it's as much of a burden in the type of work that they do. And I just think that as you deliberate on this issue, it certainly seems unfair to charge the public for inefficiencies at agencies in terms of record management and that sort of discrepancy. You're asking for the very same records, really, from two different agencies and getting these radically different responses. Um, when I was in state government as a general counsel, you know, every uh, couple times a year, all the general counsels would get together, and it became clear to me, and records was always an issue, and it became clear to me that every agency was handling these record requests differently, every agency was handling their record management differently, and every agency was handling charging for documents differently. And that seemed crazy to me. And it seemed crazy to the other general counsels, and we always discussed having a uniform system that was fair, both in terms of record management and in terms of how agencies responded. And that's an issue that still has not been resolved. And I think that's the big issue, really, here, is um, bringing all the agencies into the modern era, having good electronic record management so it isn't a burden. And then I think there's the policy question, which is what's fair, you know? How do you set up a system that recognizes the cost of state agencies but does not allow agencies to prohibitively charge in a manner that, quite frankly, seems to be designed to just dis to discourage people from getting the documents. It seems designed so people will say, you know what, it's not worth it. I'm not paying $500. I'm not paying $1,500. I'll just walk away. And that's a problem for government, you know, and democracy. Um, the inspect versus copy issue. So when we got involved with the Doyle case, it was in a large part because of the issues we were having with the Agency of Agriculture. And we started to make requests to inspect at the Agency of Agriculture so we can go down and look at the documents and then kind of hone in on what we really wanted. So we did uh, file the amicus brief and cited the law, the law that you heard reviewed at the beginning, and you know what the decision was in that case. Um, since the Doyle case, I, the inspection provision has been helpful. I had one instance where I did make a request to inspect the ag agency made. Now in the old days, I, I, I'm old enough now that like, I remember I used to make requests to inspect and then it would be like a, you know, a box, right? You'd go there, there'd be a box of documents and I would go through them and then I would say, there could be hundreds of documents in the box. And I only really, I, I would sit there all day, I'd go for lunch, I'd come back, it was really a very pleasant, quiet day. I have five documents I wanted copies, right? So then I would say to whoever was in charge, I said, can I go use your copy machine and copy the five documents? And they would say yes. And I would pay, you know, 50 cents probably, 10 cents a copy or something like that. But now, so now when I made my request to inspect, they sat me in a room on a computer and I said, here's all the documents, we just put them all on this computer. And I went through them and I got to the end of the day and I said, okay, there was 100 documents and I said, I'd like copies of five. And initially, they, it was right after the Doyle ruling, so they were like, um, I think we have to charge you for the whole thing. And I said, I don't think that's consistent with the law. I said, I just want to hit print on these five. Can I just hit print? And they said, no, but we could hit print. And I said, okay, then go ahead and do it. And then they called some lawyers and they decided that they would print the documents and then they charged me like whatever the rate, it, it was less than a dollar I think for, for the whole thing. So that's how that went down and clearly it showed me that they're still trying to figure out, the agencies are trying to figure out how to implement this decision. I don't know where they're at, you know. Uh, I don't think there's consistency as I'm just going back to what I said before. And I think there really needs to be consistency, but as you move forward, I just wish, hope you consider all these factors and uh, understand that we need to have fair access to documents. We can't have exorbitant charges that are, could be used to discourage people from getting those documents. And the inspection option has been, is a useful option, certainly for a group like VNRC, but I can certainly see for an average citizen that says, I just want to go in and I just want to look, right? I just want to know about this one thing, and I don't, I don't, and I want to look. I'm not asking for an FTP site, and I'm not asking for copies of hundreds of documents. Um, so that's basically what I, what I wanted to say, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Don't you think it's kind of bizarre? To, which part? <laughs> the experience you had in terms of, you know, one agency saying one thing. Yes, the same it is. Did you ever say it's, to the Ag Department? I have. Me if I have, and if, as Senator Brink would tell you, the, 
Ag agency and AR don't seem to care what each other think about oh, these that's things. True. <laughs> As you know, right? I forgot about that. Yeah, that's not good. So that's a whole other thing. Well, you know, it, it, uh, thank you, Mr. Grove. The, the point for me as a citizen legislator is you know, we're lightly staffed. We leave for roughly seven months of the year. Even an issue you're trying to follow, it's difficult to follow from home and at a distance. And so if we have groups like the NRC or CLF who have the expertise, time, and are dedicated to looking at things on everyone's behalf, it's a real problem if they can't really help us have a clear picture of what's going on. And we stand we all stand to lose, so, yeah. Yeah, and we don't really care who asks or why right. they ask. It has to be. Right. I mean, I'm just saying it because I know this issue and right. I've worked with these folks and it's been very right. helpful that they're asking these questions. Right. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And we're not charging for it. I appreciate that. Okay. <laughs> well, and you're not making me pay for your dinner. Sure. And, well, your cell phone didn't come. So if, if a legislative committee asks for it, makes a, could, could we as a committee make a public records request and then be charged or not charged for it? Good question. Pardon? Well, I, was, I wasn't exactly asking you, but since you're here, I'll ask you. Now, I was just saying, we, you know, we see what citizens go through we, and what these organizations go through. What if legislators as a group, you know, our, if our committee makes a public records request, are we going to be charged for it? I wouldn't want to be the head of that agency that refused to give you right. records. It just seems so. Hey, John Grunt, you, Chris. <laughs> well, that's the best guy to think about. It. You may be less, and sometimes the response is more vigorous than others. <laughs> so, welcome. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Jim Kondo, Secretary of State. Um, and I want to preface, I've got my cough drops here because okay. I've had a pretty good head cold this week. Um, so if I take a break to put a cough drop in, you'll know why. Uh, thank you for providing me the opportunity to discuss the important issue of public records and access in Vermont. The issue is something that I've been incredibly passionate about. It was a key issue when I first ran for Secretary of State in 2010. And over the past decade, my deputy and I have made over 60 visits to cities and towns all over the state to talk at every corner of the state to talk about the importance of open meetings, public records, and Vermont's right to know laws. Just a few months ago, my deputy, Chris Winters, and I finished up the fifth biennial tour round of what we like to call the transparency tour. Before I go on, I just want to give you a little bit of my background, and I think many of you know that. 18 years as the South Burlington City Council, the last eight of those years I was the chair. Eight years in the Vermont State Senate, where I chaired Senate Education and this committee as well. And then I have, in my approximate 10 years now with, as Vermont Secretary of State, I don't just talk about transparency, I actually walk the walk. Those of you who know me know that I've been a longtime proponent of government transparency. And right now, I think we can all agree that trust in government is at an all-time low. It seems like I make this statement every year, and it continues to be true, as the average Vermonter becomes more and more disenchanted with what is happening in Washington, D.C., and here in Montpelier. Please don't think I believe secrecy and bad behavior are running rampant. I don't. But it does take, it doesn't take but a few bad apples to spoil the bunch. <coughs> As government, the public paints us all with the same broad brush. I've always believed that sunshine is the best disinfectant and that if we want to restore public faith in our government, the best way to do that is to ensure that our government is as transparent as possible. I want you to understand that this really is about the public's right to know, and the public is anyone. It's not about the burdens on state government. Just who is the public? It's Vermonters, our average citizens, media, attorneys representing those citizens. Access to public records gives the public a critical tool to be able to audit, criticize, and hold our government accountable. By doing our work in the open, it's as if we have 600,000 Vermonters looking over our shoulder. Hopefully, in the end, we earn that public's trust. I cannot emphasize this enough. 
the records created in the course of government business actually belong to the public, not to the agencies. As government officials, we are just the custodians in possession of them. Is it fair to charge Vermonters for the inefficiency of government? And I think uh, uh, I think that John just talked about that. So what is the public record? A public record is any written or recorded information, regardless of physical form or characteristics, produced or acquired in the course of public agency business. All records created or acquired by government are public records. Some of those records have uh, exemptions to prevent disclosure. <coughs> public records are not limited to just uh, to just just paper records, which is important, seeing as it is 2020 and much of the work we do now is in a digital environment. The bottom line is, all government records again are public records, though some of those are exempt from disclosure for good reason. This committee, just like committees of the past, may be tempted to try to make further exemptions based on burdensome, uh, by, based on burdensome of seemingly vindictive requests or requesters. This will be a difficult endeavor and against the wishes of the public in general. Anyone can request a public record. Anyone can request a public record. And neither the identity nor the motive of the requester can be considered when weighing access. That was in Schlansky versus the City of Burlington Supreme Court decision back in 2010. And they actually said, quote unquote, the identity and motive of the requester cannot be considered when weighing access to public documents. This is the law. It is critically important to ensure that bias for or against a requester does not enter into the equation and that all requesters are treated equally under the law and granted access to the records to which they are entitled. It's also important to note that the Supreme Court has upheld the notion that while government agencies may charge for actual cost to produce a copy of a record, they may not charge for an inspection of a record. That was the finding of the court in their 2019 Doyle versus Burlington PD decision. Yet even today, we have state agencies arguing they may charge a person inspecting a record for a copy when they snap a picture of the record with their cell phone. To be blunt, arguing that state agencies can seek to recoup costs from a requester for taking a picture of a public record with their own device while inspecting it is a twisted interpretation of the law and of this decision. First, a fee may only be charged if a copy is requested and if a government employee then produces that copy. Second, they can only charge for the actual cost of the copy. If I'm taking a picture with my cell phone, what's the cost to government? Zero. Depends on I understand there's a burden in producing some of these records for inspection, and it is most often a minimal burden, but there are times when it can be significant, no question. In my view, it is clear the burden appropriately falls on government, not on the public. I also recognize there are times when significant redactions need to be made to protect personally identifying information or personal medical information or other exempt information, and that too comes at a cost to the government. Is it fair to charge a citizen hundreds or thousands of dollars to inspect the public record? I think not. However, the courts have clearly stated that these costs when producing a record for inspection cannot be passed on to the requester. Otherwise, this would put yet another hurdle in the way of access. And I can't say it enough. The public has a right to know. I will note, as Tanya Marshall has pointed out, that if proper record management practices are in place from the get-go, the time, energy, and cost to the agency of producing these records is significantly, re significantly reduced. And I think we've heard other speakers say the same thing. The time to manage records is not after you receive the public record request. It, it should be done before the record request. And I think uh, Pat Gable mentioned that, where they actually do that process. That's where we should be looking to increase efficiency and cut costs through better records management and by harnessing the digital tools we now have and that are coming that can make public access better than ever. Navigating who to ask and how to request public records 
is a big enough hurdle for most Vermonters. When you combine this with a deny first, wait for the legal action mentality, it, and then pile on costs on top of that, the law did, that the law did not contemplate, we're left with a situation where the only option members of the public have is to seek legal counsel. Those are the people who so often call us, rarely taking their cases to court. And they become dissatisfied, disgruntled, and disenchanted. In my opinion, we should be looking to find ways to increase access, not walking it back. I have several ideas for the improving of Public Records Act, but this is not the time or place to go into it. However, in short, I think Vermont should create, you know, I do think that Vermont should create an open government ombudsperson um, and, and clarify once and for all, there is no charge for inspection of public records. I'll close by going back to the underlying value that I believe should guide these discussions. Government transparency, which includes the public's right to access, is critical to, functioning, to a functioning democracy. It keeps public officials and agencies honest and accountable while allowing us to prove we are worthy of that public trust. Most importantly, it keeps Vermonters informed and in control. And I want to thank you for your time and attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. So I have just, I, I mean, I, I understand that this is a, um, I misunderstood before, I think. Um, so why, it seems to me very, and I'm not sure this is the right word, schizophrenic, this system that we have. So if I, as a private citizen, ask for a copy of something, I'm charged for the time that it takes them to prepare that copy, in addition to the actual cost of the copy. But if I ask to inspect it, the same time goes into it, but I'm not charged for anything. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. Why would we charge anything to, to, to prepare for making a copy when we don't charge? I mean, why do we charge anything at all then at all? And why do we have a charge chart? We have a charge chart because there was the uh, assumption that we were going to charge for the preparation of the of the document. No. Why do we have a charge chart then? It's for copies. It actually says, if you look at the, on our you website. You mean if an attorney makes the, stands there at the copy machine and makes the copy, we charge one thing, and if a clerk stands there and makes the copy, there isn't there a I'm not sure what, what you, I don't, it doesn't matter whether it's a, an attorney, a secretary, or, or a, uh, uh, just a, a staff person. It's, it's, it, the charge of the copy. The I, charge of the copy. If you're using the, the, the state equipment, yeah. then you're charged for that. That charge, the actual cost, takes into account the cost of the equipment, the I cost get, of the I electricity, the, all those things. I get that. What well, I thought that there, at one point, there was a some kind of a chart, and I'm, I guess I'm dreaming or in another lifetime or something, but I thought there was a some kind of a chart at one point that said, if, Tanya, do you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Uh, the secretary's table is where you see the uniform charges. Okay. It, charges. It's on our website. Right, and so why do we have- staff time, there's a set, job, there's a set right. amount, no matter who's doing the copying, and it's physically copying the record. So, um, and secretary is doing the copying. Charge listed on that uniform charge schedule that's set by statute and rule for preparing. Only if there's a request to make a new record. Oh, there's a certain, if you have to so make there's yeah. There's three different parameters. So, but that that uniform schedule is the only set schedule that state agencies can use, and then local government can use it or have to use it unless they have actually gone through the same process within their own. And that's for actually making the copies. So physically making the copies. The charge goes back to the actual cost of the physical making of a copy. That has that been in the law since 1976. That's, yeah. We can provide more details yeah. about that. So, and, and Just, sorry. Yeah. So, let's, and let's understand why do we even have this law, Public Records Access? Well, no, we know why we have it. 1976. What happened around that time? Watergate. Watergate. Exactly. And, this is and, a quiz. And what are, we, what are we discussing these days in Washington? <laughs> Other issues we, we, like that. So, but I, my point is that 
it's events like that that create some of these issues. But at the same time, if you look at what the Constitution says, then look at what our statutes, which yeah. refer, refer back to the Constitution, it says that the public has a right to know. I, I, I understand that. I just think we have such a schizophrenic system here that if I ask for a copy, I'm going to be charged all the time that it takes to prepare that. No, I See, thought I, I'd say, yeah. that's what they that's what we were being told by I think that's what Chris Herrick said. That's what people do. And that's what they, they okay. Yeah, and Chris is not accepted. So that's so why isn't that isn't that the way you understand how we I thought I understood it. Quite honestly, when I leave this room in a little while, hopefully, um, <laughs> Somebody says to me, do we charge for public records access? I'm going to, ask, access. I'm going to say, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. I don't really quite get it. I so just like, hear from but the here's, people. Here's, some people, some here's people the point yes, I would make. Said no. Some people said for the copy. Some yeah. people said only if the guy pushes the button. I mean, it seems like it's all over the place. Yeah. So, Senator yeah. White, you, you made the comment that perhaps what we should do is not charge at all. Well, I don't And I, I would agree with that statement. Well, right. I'm, not, I'm not proposing anything necessarily now. I'm just trying to understand this schizophrenic system that we have. And I bet we'll hear from Wendy and Mike and some other people about, about this. Yes. I'm not sure schizophrenic so much as inconsistent and, and how, how does the balance have value. But I, I'd also love to know what our, our, what our cost is to the, the state. I mean, if that's even tracked for all, for, you know, what are we spending in terms of time? Uh, and what are we bringing in on those that charge chart? Do we even know? Um, Title I in BSA 318A is the tracking. Um, the Secretary of Administration's report on that related to the cabinet. Yeah. Tucker's ready. Good work, and then he'll get an you instant. You can access that information through Vermont's right. Open Data Portal. Okay. Um, How so much does it cost? <laughs> <laughs> How much did it cost us to create the Open Data Portal? Um, the Data is comprehensive. I don't know whether it is complete, but you can see when an agency posts that they have charged a certain amount and has been paid. You can see for that request how much was received by the agency. Okay, we'll, but, we'll check that out. And for reference, the um, uniform schedule of fees adopted by the Secretary of State does distinguish between different levels of staff. There is routine yeah. staff time, $19.80 per hour. There is professional staff time, and there is IT staff right. time, which is the highest tier. And the criteria all fit into complying with the request for a copy. Right. That's the way the statute is phrased. That's the way it was brought. So it, they do charge for preparing it because it's complying with the request. <coughs> OK, I just, I just wanted to make sure I understood that. Thank you, Tucker. Now you understand it? No. <laughs> but thank clear. you, Tucker, because I understand it better. Okay. Okay. Any more questions for the secretary? No. <laughs> thank you. It's always good to see you, sir. <laughs> it's always good to be seen. Wendy? I'm not you. I guess you. <laughs> is, it, is it okay? Sure. It's okay. Is it? If, you, if you don't get done today, if you don't get done today, I can't come next week. You know, week, so. the, the, the oh, Wendy, I it's good today. to see you. We can turn it down a tiny bit. The surround ones would be great. I mean, I apologize. It's just like overwhelming for some unknown reason staring at all these lights. She just had an eye operation. Yes. Yeah, one of them dips the, or two, yeah. What did we do here, a little switcheroo? Yeah, she said I'd do that. <coughs> That's helpful. Depending on thank whether you. you continue this till next week, I can't come next week. So okay. Oh, so. okay. Thank you. Okay. And because I'm not sure when DJ's calling in either. So. Well, we're going to call him. So. Okay. I tried to text Dan, but I. <coughs> okay. Uh, Madam Chairman and members of the uh, Senate Government Operations Committee, good afternoon. My name is Mike Donahue. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Press Association, which represents the interest of 11 daily. <clears throat> and roughly four dozen non-daily papers that circulate and cover the news in your communities and in Vermont. I'm also here today in my capacity as first vice president of the New England First Amendment Coalition, which is a six-state effort by journalists, academics, librarians, lawyers, and just regular citizens who are interested in the protections of the five freedoms covered under the First Amendment. 
And as some of you know, I spent 47 years as a writer at the Free Press, beginning my senior year as a high school sports writer. <clears throat> uh, these past few years of retirement, some media outlets have used me to cover some stories, and uh, I've always had a love and belief in the public's right to know the truth, and that's why public records are such a vital part of what my career has been around. Before I go on, I do want to acknowledge the work this committee has done through the years on open government, open meetings, public records, transparency, and everything like that. Uh, as the chair well knows, she and I have talked about this a couple of times, the BF grade that Vermont often got for transparency by the different evaluations state by state, and that we're trying to move up and get you into the, at least the C category. I still hope you're number one someday. I'm, you know, even being in the top three or five would be, would be good. I'd love to be number one at some point for transparency. <clears throat> the Press Association is here today to continue to offer our support and help as you may consider any new legislation, including upholding the recent Vermont Supreme Court decision about free inspection of records. Since that decision in September, Democrats led by Secretary of State Condos, Republicans led by Governor Scott, and many others have all made it clear that free inspection should continue to be the law. <clears throat> Pretty much everybody agrees. Unfortunately, until I guess last Thursday, I was under the impression uh, in my discussions with Attorney General T.J. Donovan that he wanted to institute a uh, so-called pay-to-play or pay-to-read, if you will, government system charging taxpayers to have access to the daily operations of state and local government. This is really about the cost of doing business for government. The Vermont Legislature, as a governing entity, has always been open to the public. The copies of your printed bills, the committee hearings, such as this that you host, the debates that are heard on the floor, they're all open to the public. Anybody can hear them, see them. The cost comes for this legislature out of an annual budget for the legislature to ensure transparency. In my discussions with Attorney General Donovan, <clears throat> he often cites some law firms are asking for records that might be used to sue the state of Vermont. As Secretary of State Condos pointed out, the law is clear that why somebody might want to see a public record is never relevant. That's the law. It's also irrelevant as to who is asking for it. But here's the reality. If that law firm just files suit against the state of Vermont without getting those records, all of those requested records will eventually have to be turned over by the state through the pretrial process known as discovery. So either we can give them to them now or we can give them to them later. But at some point, if they file suit, they're going to get a copy. <clears throat> And, and obviously, when they get them in discovery, there is no charge for anything. So there's boxes and boxes. <clears throat> Yet there are several benefits to full transparency. By giving the public records early to a requester, the state of Vermont may actually save its taxpayers considerable money in the long run. The law firm may realize that it's possible that its possible legal claim is unworthy and then no lawsuit is actually filed against the state of Vermont. Or that the law firm may realize that what they thought was a potential multi-million dollar judgment against the state of Vermont is really worth only a small fraction. In that case, the settlement can be reached early without the time and full expense of preparing a court case and the time and expense of judges, staffs, and courtrooms. The pay to play or pay to read model in government goes against all transparency traditions in Vermont. Does your local library charge residents to come in and read the morning paper 
or for your librarian to pull some historic book out of a back room because somebody wants to read it or anything else that they may be have available at the library magazines or whatever. No, that is covered in the annual budget for that library. Why should taxpayers <clears throat> get charged to read minutes of government meetings or letters of town boards or even to review the legal bills submitted to the town? Once you start charging to read public records, you have to wonder if charging the public to attend public meetings is far behind. The legislature, the media, and others should be encouraging all Vermonters to get involved in their local government. Yes, it can be a pain to have people looking over your shoulder, of, uh, looking over the shoulder of government le leaders, but that was how this country was set up. We all know the opposite is much worse, and that's why this country and state was founded. In closing, I just a couple of things. As this issue of free inspection goes forward, you can clearly expect those opposed to open government will invoke the sky will fall argument if charges are not made to the, if if changes are not made to the current law and make things more secretive. That same old tired argument was invoked several times in the past on public records by people against transparency and. Some of you were on the committee when the, a couple of these things happened. I will give you just a quick couple of rem reminders or cases. Several years ago, there was a push to ensure public records were available at actual cost to taxpayers. The legislature found that depending on the town or the office, copies of public records cost taxpayers between zero and a dollar a page. Some towns, we're using excessive charges to help pay for its municipal or school governments, paying for police departments and other salaries. In some cases, town clerks are even actually able to keep the fees that they charged for copy. This committee helped pass the actual cost law and the current fee for photocopies is five cents. Government is not losing money and the sky never fell in that case. More recently, your committee helped craft a bill that allows people seeking public records to recover their legal fees if they have to file a lawsuit and the judge determines the public records were improperly withheld by government. Again, the Attorney General and others predicted the sky would fall with this big change. It hasn't. Your legislation actually has made government leaders more accountable and more responsive in most cases because they know that is now the law. <clears throat> Thank you for your time. The VPA stands ready again this year to assist this committee in any of your open government transparency issues. Um, and I did have two or three other little things that I wanted to respond to. Senator Brock mentioned this whole issue of this side things. There are a couple of examples I'd just throw on the table. The Vermont Principals Association technically is not covered under open meeting and open government, but there was a change or a proposal uh, when Governor Dean was in office that the State Education Department take over the VPA duties. They said they didn't want them, and the VPA, as a compromise, said we will follow the Vermont Public Records Law and the Open Meeting Law, and and they, that's one agency. The, I can tell you, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns subscribes to that, even though they are technically not a government entity, but they're taxpayer supported because all their dues are paid by tax dollars. <clears throat> As far as redaction goes, and, and several people talked about uh, management of the system, it's been at least 40 years that I can recall that state government has been on notice, or local government has been on notice, about proper management of records. There's a case out of Rutland County, Senator, you may remember this, the Rutland, I think it was the Rutland Herald, sued the Rutland Police Department over the police law and 
Judge Morris at the time basically ruled that, in fact, as we all know, police logs were public record. Uh, but the argument was, well, there's sometimes confidential or juvenile information on that. And Judge Morris, in his written decision, said, that's not our problem. You need to manage your records. And that's going back to like 1978 or 1980, I believe, that case. I never went to the Supreme Court, but clearly I remember that case where it was, you've got to manage your records. It's been 40 years, and we're still hearing people aren't managing their records. So um, as far as the judiciary system goes, I enjoyed what Pat Gable said. Uh, the media has been invited to a meeting later this month to look at their computer system to see if it will uh, uh, pass muster and uh, in our eyes. And the other thing in, in redaction is uh, sometimes these, I don't want to pick on the state police, but they sometimes have two or three different people look at it. And, and I fear that people are being charged for all these people to look at it when maybe only one person really needs to look at it. And, and there is an over-redaction on a lot of things. And to give you one example, I put in a public records request to the state police for a case file. And it eventually came to me. And I, gave, I actually gave them the case name, number, everything. And when I got the thing, even the case number was black. And I'd given it to them. <laughs> so, so it's like, why are you blacking it out when I already have it? And, and the other thing was, how did I know this was actually the case I wanted? They sent me a case. I don't know if it was, in fact, the oh, case I wanted. Redacted. They had redacted something. So there is some over-redaction that you may want to address at some point if, if you are going down that road. Possible creative writing, writing about something. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I, I do have, um, having had more contact with, um, through our committee, through for law enforcement, I do have some sympathies with their system, how they have to redact things, because particularly the videos, that seems to me just impossible to do. That You can't keep proper records of those. They're either there or they're not there. And, and you're, you're capturing people who shouldn't be captured on, who, who shouldn't be exposed when they, when, if somebody makes a records request. Anyway, I, I do have some sympathies for the way they, they have to protect uh, uh, victims and other people who aren't connected to a case. So, and I, I think, but, but and I, I might I, be wrong about that, but it's. I, I question why so much gets redacted in a public event, like when they have public video. I mean, <clears throat> say somebody takes a, a swing at a referee in a, in a basketball game. They would redact everybody, including all the players that are out on the court. And it would just show the one guy taking a swing at a, at a, at a basketball referee. When everybody, 3,000 fans are at Patrick Gym and could see it. Why are we taking, why are we blacking out? Yeah, I'm not and, concerned about but, public but, events, but private things, but, um, domestics but and things when people have their body cams on and, and they record something and you have somebody else in the car do they really need to be recorded that they were in the car when the car was stopped? Uh, so I think it's a case it's, by it's, case it's, basis. It is. I mean, I it think is, and we that, have to that when somebody's in the privacy of their home, I can understand there's certain things like that. But when it's out on a public street and it's unruly Saturday night, and the cops respond to a fight in progress, yeah, and then suddenly, <clears throat> and it is a case by case. But anyway. So my question about the schizophrenic system that we have, because I saw both of you going, we do have a schizophrenic system, right? I okay. agree with Secretary of State Condos. I don't think you ought to be charging. It's, it's a cost of doing business. No, but I mean, I mean you, the way we have it now. Yeah. Okay. So strike, strike the fees. I'm glad with that. We're, we're happy with I'm that. Sure you are. I mean, if you, well, <laughs> I but, don't. But, 
but if you're going to start parceling out when you're going to charge, are you, is, is your fire department going to start charging when they start responding? No, no, no. I'm just saying that the system that we've been operating under is interpreted in different agencies in different ways, it seems to me, and that we need to, we need to figure out what that is and what the balance is. That's all I'm and, saying. And I'll just tell you one quick story. I, I asked for inspection the other day on, on a public employee who was arrested for DWI, and I want to know if they were suspended, term, uh, what happened to them, if they were suspended, uh, put on paid leave while they were investigated or whatever. And the town manager wouldn't tell me. So I said, okay, I'm going to have to file a public records request for the payroll sheets, time sheets. Hmm. And I want to inspect them and try to figure out whether the person was ever suspended, put on leave, whatever. And I sent it on a Friday afternoon, late, and by Monday morning at 9 o'clock, they had already scanned it in all the time sheets and sent them to me. I didn't ask for copies, but they took the time no charge. I guess they didn't want me sitting in their office listening to things, but but they sent all the timesheets for the person from September to the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And I do, um, you know, we talked earlier about having to, no, come on, please. Um, really needing to figure out what we're going to do by January 31st because that's the um, deadline for committee bills and if we're going to do anything, make any changes at all, whatever they might be. But Senator Collimore just pointed out to me that uh, Randy Brock's bill gave us a vehicle so that we really don't have to be done by January 31st. We can, if there are specific issues that we need to address that have may not even have anything to do with this central issue that we're talking about, but other issues around public records that we have a vehicle to do that, so. Okay. You have a number on that bill, by the way? Yes, yeah. I do, as a matter of fact, because I have it right here. 305, yeah. Yep. It just came out today. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me here. And for the record, my name is Wendy Mays, and I am the executive director of the Vermont Association of Broadcasters. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm here today to speak on behalf of the eight television stations and 98 radio stations operating throughout the state of Vermont. And the VAB represents over 600 uh, Vermonters working in commercial and non-commercial radio and television stations on both sides of the cameras and microphones. We are the DJs, anchors, reporters, meteorologists, and sportscasters you invite into your homes, your cars, and your workplaces to, re to provide you with the local weather forecasts, high school and college sports scores, music, shows, and most importantly, real news that Vermonters trust and rely on to stay informed. Like elected officials, radio and television stations have a duty, responsibility, and obligation to serve the Vermont communities we are licensed to. And like you, we are part of the checks and balances system that defines our country's great democracy. Without journalists who ask the hard questions and dig deep to find the truth, who would hold people in positions of power accountable? I'm an optimist uh, and know that most people are inherently good. But to, to borrow Secretary, Sec, Secretary of State Condos' analogy, uh, there are some bad apples out there making bad decisions and taking advantage of and abusing their power to the detriment of innocent people. And we all work together to get those bad apples out of our state's barrel. The legislature exists to create laws, police exist to enforce laws, courts exist to interpret laws, and the media exists to uncover and expose lawbreakers. And since bad apples are not usually forthcoming with the truth, in most cases, records are the only way for us to find it. 
That is why the Vermont Association of Broadcasters supports the Vermont Supreme Court's ruling and the position of Governor Phil Scott and Secretary of State Jim Condos that inspection of public records remain free. And I'll even throw in there, I think everything should be free too. I am, uh, I'll go back to that. Much like our election system, which costs money to operate, it's the cost of doing business in a democracy. And just like citizens should never have to pay a poll tax to vote, they should never have to pay a fee to look at records that belong to the public. Right now, the request to inspect records seems very reactive. But like Tanya Marshall testified earlier, if records are managed properly from the beginning, following an organized and consistent protocol, like reviewing and redacting before they get filed, they only have to be handled one time and then are available for anyone who wants to see them. Between high-tech keyword searches and automatic redaction software, and I looked it up, there's at least six programs out there right now for redaction software, including one for video. Uh, there's scanners and unlimited cloud-based storage. There are many cost-effective tools and solutions local and state agencies can use to proactively and properly prepare records for public inspection and store them online for anyone to find and look at. I echo John's testimony that it's unfair to charge pu the public for inefficiencies in record management. And it sounds to me like uh, the Vermont Archivists is a great resource. Yeah. That's, that's being underutilized right now, I shall add. Time says maybe both. <laughs> maybe not over <laughs> I know it's possible because it is the standard that all television and radio are held to. Every station in the U.S. is licensed by the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, one of the FCC's rules is for stations to have a series of records available online for public inspection at any time. Records include a list of issues and programs that show how a station has addressed the needs and interests of its community, details about all political advertisements a station has aired, the station's equal employment activities, children's programming reports, and a whole slew of other official documents that have to be written and or updated every three months. At least one person at every station is responsible as part of their job description to make sure these documents are written uploaded, and uploaded by the quarterly deadline. Each file is date and time stamped, so if a station is late or fails to upload these documents, they risk tens of thousands of dollars in fines and possible non-renewal of their license. This standard exists whether you have a staff of four or 40 and is very time consuming. Broadcasters are held to a very high standard by the FCC, and there are very serious repercussions if we don't comply with the system they have in place that ensures the public has free access to our records. So today I heard uh, the Department of Public Safety Deputy Commissioner say that most of the 4,500 records requests uh, his department received came across his desk, and last week, um, I heard the Attorney General's Chief of Staff say that she personally handled the review and redactions for the 157 public records requests that they got last year. And that made me think, why does the Chief of Staff and the Deputy Commissioner have to spend their time redacting documents? It just seems like they have a lot more better things to do than that. Is there no one else that is qualified or capable of doing this? And why is that? Is it because the 270 plus exemptions are so subjective and open to interpretation that it's impossible for anyone except a highly trained professional to work with them? And if so, to me anyway, therein lies the burden on the custodians of the public records. Um, Senator Clarkson, you mentioned, um, you said, you used the word inconsistent, and that's the perfect word to describe what's happening on a, uh, on a real level out in the field, what our journalists are, are reporting that they are experiencing, um, and that is a big problem. If we are all confused, imagine what's happening in the small municipalities that are not even privy to things that are happening in here. 
it means everybody's confused. And even though there is a structure, it seems like there's a lot of confusion with that structure. And that's very apparent with the fact that, you know, I do agree with John's testimony. Our news departments have been quoted thousands of dollars um, to, to obtain the records that they're requesting. And it's not broad. It's very specific. And to them, those thousands of dollars is really just a brick wall for the people to say, no, you can't have them. And we're going to do it through a financial brick wall. So um, they tell me that fees are all over the place, and it, it, it's, it just varies depending on who you're talking to. So they can't ever determine in advance how much something is going to cost. And it's just uh, when you're trying to get to the truth, and th that's a brick wall that just shouldn't be there. So in closing, Vermont Association of Broadcasters urge you to join us in supporting the Vermont Supreme Court's decision, which supports freedom of information and transparent government. And I really appreciate this committee giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of Vermont's hardworking broadcast journalists today. My hope is that you will see Vermont Association of Broadcasters as a resource, and I offer to be of service to this, com to this committee in whatever capacity you need me to be as we continue this very important conversation. Thank you. Yes, Do you have, can you give us a copy of that? Yes. Or email. Yeah. Yes. I'd just like to say, Wendy, we haven't met, but uh, I, your analogy of uh, elections is was very helpful actually mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. Is is it is just part of the cost of doing business, and I think a lot of us have been thinking of the cost of the time of all these people getting this all together in, in places that aren't all perfectly set up, like Tanya's. Uh, operation, but your uh, that analogy was very helpful. So thank you. I that I took that on board. That was good. And I want to thank you for smiling at my feeble attempts at humor <laughs> earlier on in the day. <laughs> Nobody, everybody else had these stony faces. You at least smiled. <laughs> well, we're all here to have fun, right? <laughs> well, and, and just also on a on a personal note, having served with Jim Condon for so many years together in Ways and Means, it is. Sad, but also lovely that you're here, but heartbreaking for me that he's no longer the president. He, we miss him every day. He's very sorely missed. Me too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe we have TJ now on the phone. And then TJ, Jay, the you're phone. the last one on our <laughs> Clean up. <laughs> Clean up. There's no oh. handset, so I'm going to dial in. And I'm Jeanette, we've talked to Yes. Yeah. Oh, man, thank you. Gray is my name. You know, if you want to go ahead oh, with um, Jay's testimony, I, don't know I haven't chairs. dialed for one of these before, yeah. so I'm going to get some help. Okay. We're going, um, we're, this is a different uh, phone than is in our committee room, mm -hmm. so it, it's used differently, so Gail's going to go get somebody to do it. So, Jay, do you want to? Do you want to um, come now and then we'll hear from TJ afterwards, or do you want to wait? I'm happy to. I don't want to stand away for Attorney General, so it's no way to Well, why don't we, um, why don't we get Chris's vote on those two and then turn them in, and then by that time we'll have TJ dialed up and, um, um, and then we'll just keep going in order, um, unless there's some reason I I'm a yes prefer. And yes. You're a yes and a yes. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. I, you knew what they were on, right? The act yes. related to appointing town agents and the bond. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Do you want to take them up? Um, I don't know that I have everything for it. They need a sheet for the bond agent. I think we need sheets for all of them. I don't think I have that here. I don't have any of that stuff here. Oh. 
you're doing the bond is official. Correct. That's you. And Anthony. Whatever. Yes, ma'am. Um, that you're doing the uh, town agents. Yes, ma'am. And here is what you need to take up, I believe, to go. I can take them up. You just need to. Okay, if you sign them, I'll bring them up to Steve. Well, this is the one on town agent, so this will help me. <laughs> oh, dear. We have a bond. Yeah, I think so. He's doing bonded people and. Well, don't take my folder, just take the sheet. Put the folders No, that's my copy of the bill. These are mine. These are my documents. They're Is this all on record? Right now. <laughs> Charger. <laughs> that's a bond. Allison, you managed to confuse me. Sorry. I didn't mean to. I have bonded. I'm bonded here, baby. Yeah. Uh, and that says reporter is called. Yes. I know, but I don't have this sheet for that. Uh, I, and I don't. Either is my point. I don't have it. That's the sheet that Anthony should have. It's, okay, Anthony, you have right that, here. and this is right here. And here is 500. I just put that in. And if you sign that for me, and I will take it up. And, and you're doing town agents. No. No. Allison. Pull it together. Come on. All I can tell you is that not being able to see is clearly a fact. Here, Allison, he's doing Colmore is doing bonded. I, I just gave him bonded. You told me I wasn't. No, you said town agents to him. Okay. Give it to him. And this is Anthony. Okay. No, what are you doing? <laughs> This is S186. Oh, they're both H143. There's our turn. I don't have it. There is the answer. I don't have it. Okay. Well, because there wasn't a, an amendment on the other one. So we could just sign it. What's the answer? I don't either. Why isn't that coming on? Yes, I think you can. I'm 99% sure that's it. You just signed that. Yeah, that's but exactly what I get. Like okay. Okay. They're not plugged in. Let me run it to Oh, I don't know. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, we won't get them up today. That's clear. Well, it's not the end of the world. No. But yeah. We'll, do, we'll turn them in tomorrow. Oh, and I, plus, I need Betsy's notes. Well, you don't need her notes before you turn it in. No, no, no. God, they were in the phone. These are different than all the other phones. Did it work? Uh, no. I thought Betsy just came in. She came in, so she's getting shoddy. Oh. And that doesn't mean she's getting shoddy, S H O D D Y, but shoddy, S H O D D Y. I just hold the cell phone up to the microphone. Yeah, let's just call him on the on somebody's cell phone. Can you call him on your yeah. cell phone? Okay. And just hold it up to the microphone. This microphone? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Thank you. You can pretend it's like you're him. Full of good ideas. All right, we're going to we're going to continue here. What's your recommendation on how close I should hold my phone to the microphone? Well, if I just like this, you think that's good? I think so. Shot yeah. to the rescue. Oh. Hey guys. Hi. Now that I'm here, I think I'll sit here just in case he has yeah. a question or wants yeah. to refer to me somehow. Was it unplugged? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good No, it's still not working out. Uh, oh, Shadi's here already. Oh, Shadi's <laughs> here and discovered it's unplugged. You made a noise. The green light's on, but. Hello? What we need to dial? Okay. Yes, we have to give the dial to him first. Say that again, Shadi. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, it's going to be to take over. There we go. Hi. Sorry about that. Just for everybody's information.
information about who's dialing. Did you know that if you dial 911 from any of these phones in the in the state house, you have to dial 911? Just yes. Yeah, that's very helpful. Hello, Attorney Donovan. Yes. Hi, this is the Senate Government Operations Committee. We're in room 11, and we're ready for your testimony. Great. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for having me, and thanks for accommodating my schedule. I had a personal appointment up in Burlington, so I'm calling you from, from Burlington. Okay, thank you. And Charity is sitting at the witness table here in case you run into any difficulty. She'll help us out. <laughs> hey, boss. Good. Well, well I, I, I feel much better after hearing that, Senator White, so thank you for letting me know. Yep. Uh, Charity's a, an expert on this. Look, I'll be uh, relatively brief and to the point. First, again, let me thank the committee for taking this uh, issue up. I know people feel strongly uh, about this issue. And, you know, my view is that I, I think the law is clear. Um, and I think that the Doyle decision uh, is clear. But anytime we can have more clarity, um, that's a good thing. So thank, thank you for addressing this issue. You know, we get public records requests from the Attorney General's office. Uh, I think we kind of have a unique um, responsibility as attorneys. Um, you know, one of our first obligations, our ethical obligations, is attorney-client privilege. And so we're always looking, uh, obviously, to fulfill our professional responsibility to our clients. And when we're looking to respond to a public records request, the legislature has said, you know, ballpark, there's about 290 exemptions to, to, to the um, Public Records Act. And when you talk about, well, can you charge uh, for public records. I think the Doyle decision is really clear. No, you can't charge to inspect records. I think that's clear. Yes, you can for copying records. And I think on page four, paragraph eight, that sums it up. And then I, I do have a disagreement with uh, Secretary Condos. We get into this uh, um, debate about what a copy is. You know, the, the court, who, is, who has the final say in our state about what the law is, uh, said that um, this, and I quote from the decision on page four, the legislature, um, when they said a copy, the legislature meant a record that a requester could keep and review wherever and whenever the requester chooses. A photo from a cell phone fits that definition as a copy a record that the requester could keep and review wherever and whenever the requester chooses. That is a copy under the law, in my opinion. I respect that people have a, dis a different opinion than that, but I think it's very clear. I also disagree with Secretary Condos. If I understood his testimony clear uh, last week, I think in the House, that a copy has to be a paper record. We're living in a digital world. Our phones are computers. Technology is outpacing the law. The idea that we're going to define a copy as a, pe a paper record when we're, when we're operating in the digital world um, is outdated. Uh